the chaotic end of a bitter war. The world's largest airplane is loaded with orphans and headed for safety. Advancing throttles now. Time. Go. We needed to get out of missile range. But only minutes into their escape, there was this loud explosion, one quick bang. What was that? The plane is out of control. I kept going faster and faster and faster. And headed for the ground. And then, it was quiet. South Vietnam, April 1975. After more than 10 years of fighting, the United States is on the verge of defeat. The end of the war is fast approaching. The enemy is closing in on the capital. On April the 4th, at a military base in the South Vietnamese capital of Saigon, a strange cargo is being loaded onto an enormous C-5A galaxy. This is one of the largest planes in the world. The C-5A is primarily a cargo plane. Its hold is wide enough to carry tanks and tall enough to move buses. Above the cargo area, there's a small number of seats. Both the passenger area and the cargo bay are being pressed into service today. Dozens of Vietnamese orphans are being loaded onto the plane to be flown to safety. There are thousands of orphans to be flown out before the North Vietnamese take Saigon. Barb Adams works for the American Embassy. She and her daughter Linda are also fleeing. On April 4th, my mom came home and told me that I had one hour to pack one suitcase and that we were going to be escorting the orphans on an orphan airlift back to the United States. When my mother and I went upstairs to the troop compartment, there's traditional airline seats, and all of the seats were filled with babies. Sergeant Ray Snediger is in charge of loading the plane's massive cargo bay. Make sure it's secure. We got people down here. It was hard to control the situation. So many people were there, so much news media, so many people from the orphanages, so many military people, that uh, it was actually pure chaos. Just the day before, American President Gerald Ford announced the start of this desperate mission of mercy, a remarkable effort called Operation Baby Lift. I have directed that C-5A aircraft and other aircraft, especially equipped to care for these orphans, during the flight be sent to Saigon. I expect these flights to begin within the next 36 to 48 hours. Arnold Isaacs was covering the end of the war for the Baltimore Sun. We had transport aircraft flying into Saigon every day, unloading military supplies and going back empty. Uh, and so it was decided that they could carry out the orphans on those returning flights. There were a lot of cameras and reporters out there covering the loading and the departure of the plane.
Captain Bud Trainer is in charge of Operation Babylift's first flight. I got a call from the command post back in the States, and they said to me, how many people could you take out of Saigon if you were asked? Because of the last minute nature of the flight, they're running behind schedule. The plane is already five hours late, and Captain Trainer wants to be in the air. He orders the cargo bay doors to be closed. Tell me what's doors closed. Loadmaster closed cargo bay doors. The youngest of the 145 children have been crammed into the upper passenger section of the jet. My mother and I were both assigned three rows of seats with maybe four to a row. So it would be 12 to 15 babies that we would be taking care of on the flight, feeding them, changing them, whatever they needed to have done. There are 102 older children in the cargo area below. A number of adults from the American Embassy are also down here keeping an eye on the orphans. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Getting out of Vietnam starts by leaving the safety of the US base. Advancing throttles now. 15. 20. Time, go. that we had to take off at a pretty steep angle. And we didn't have seats, so we were to kneel on the floor between the seats during takeoff. The cargo plane is heading for Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. It's a two and a half hour flight. From there, the orphans will be sent to adoption agencies in North America and Australia. We needed to take off from Saigon and make a, a very rapid ascent to get out of missile range. Cargo planes are easy targets. They're slow moving and large. The possibility of an attack is very real. Just five days before, North Vietnamese troops captured the South's second largest city, Da Nang. South Vietnamese forces are retreating towards Saigon. In the capital, the situation is chaotic. Thousands of South Vietnamese civilians are desperate to leave. Every day, another province was lost, especially after Da Nang fell. The population of Saigon, I think, began to uh, fall into a sort of a paralyzed, petrified terror. Never, not for one moment that I remember, did you have a feeling of anyone rallying to defend the country. How's the air in the troop compartment? It's all right. The baby's still squalling, or? They quieted down with all the noise. Most are asleep. This is 
Then, shortly after takeoff, as the plane climbs through 23,000 feet, this mist and so until it dissipates it's you cannot see and there was this loud explosion one quick bang what was that and she said i'm not sure and you could feel the plane heading downward debris started flying around it's a classic decompression Somewhere, there's a massive hole in the plane's fuselage. The air inside the jet is rushing out. At 23,000 feet, there's barely enough oxygen to breathe. So I looked over at the co-pilot, and he was putting on his oxygen mask, and I thought, I'd better do that too. The oxygen masks have dropped automatically, but on such an overcrowded flight, there aren't enough to go round. The ones that are available weren't designed to reach babies. As I looked out the window, I saw the ocean. And I said to my mom, I said, we're crashing, aren't we? At the back of the passenger compartment, Lieutenant Marsha Wirtz checks in with the crew. From there, she can usually see down to the cargo bay below her. Pilot, this is Wurtz. I'm at the top right of the troop compartment. I can see the China Sea at the rear of the plane. What? The cargo door is gone. With more than 300 people on board, Captain Bud Trainer's jet has lost its breathable air. Somehow, his massive aircraft has been badly damaged. And he's a long way from a safe place to land. The inaugural flight of Operation Babylift will not make it out of Vietnam. The next few minutes will determine if anyone even survives. Oxygen levels are dangerously low. Unlike the passenger compartment above, there are only a few portable masks for passengers in the cargo bay. My first priority after a rapid decompression is to get the aircraft back down to a breathing altitude for all the passengers, which is 10,000 feet. I'm taking it back to the airport. And so I turned 180 degrees, and now I'm heading back for Saigon. But before he gets back to Saigon, Sergeant Snedeker. trainer needs to know how bad the situation is. Uh, the airplane is going down in a left bank at that particular point. I, I sense that we're going down. I go to the cockpit. Sir, see what's going on. And Captain Trainer tells me to go to the cargo compartment to see what's happening down there. When I was in my descent, I went to my maximum speed, which is what you're supposed to do, to get to 10,000 feet. I got to my maximum speed, and I pulled back on the yoke, and nothing happened. I kept going faster and faster and faster. Trainer's plane is diving to the ground, and he can't get it to pull up. At the back of the plane, Ray Snedeker descends into the center of the storm. When I came down, I noticed there was a lot of chaos in the cargo compartment. Obviously, people were frightened. So I'm actually crawling and stepping over people that are combat loaded on the floor. And I saw this huge gaping hole in the back of the airplane. All daylight back there. And then Snedeker spots what could be an even more serious problem. 
hydraulic fluid is pumping out. Control cables are dangling in the breeze, flopping back and forth. And it just reminded me of looking at some spaghetti. That was the first thought in my mind. The flight engineer also notices that the plane is losing its hydraulic fluid fast. Pilot, we've lost number one hydraulic system. We've just lost number two hydraulics. Hydraulic fluid helps the crew move the massive control surfaces on the plane. The rudder and elevator at the back, and the ailerons and flaps on the wing. There are four separate hydraulic systems on the plane. Now two of them are completely empty. And as trainer dives towards 10,000 feet, his plane is going much faster than it should, and he can't pull up. And I kept pulling back on the yoke, thinking that I could slow down, pull back more and more and more. I'm not getting anything out of the yoke. How about you? Nothing. And we were just totally puzzled. What is going wrong? Pulling on his yoke should bring the plane's nose up and slow it down. If he can't pull the plane up soon, it'll plow straight into the ground. And I'm concerned at that point we're still falling. We're not leveling out. In the belly of the plane, Ray Snedeker reports what he sees to the cockpit. Pilot! Cargo bay! Go ahead. And I told him that the part of the ramp was missing, pressure door was gone, and hydraulic lines and control cables had been cut. The problem is now much worse than we thought. Declare an emergency. Saigon, this is Mac 80218, and we're declaring emergency. We require immediate return to bay. Unlike commercial airlines, there was nobody that came onto the PA system and announced what was happening. So I just kind of focused on the children. After struggling with his crippled jet, Trainer's efforts finally seem to pay off. And now the airplane levels itself off and we're th saying, wow, thank goodness that we're finally making it out of this. As quickly as it leveled off, the plane begins to climb again. The nose of the jet begins pulling up into the sky. And so I relax the yoke. And what happens? Nothing. I'm still going straight up now. Unless Trainer can gain some speed, his plane will soon stall and tumble from the sky. And it got higher and higher. And pretty soon, I'm going almost straight up. In desperation, he dips one wing, forcing the nose down. I'm now in a very, very steep dive. and. There's nothing I can do, seemingly, to bring the nose up. And so, counterintuitive, I added power. And when I did that, the airplane pulled itself out of the dive, and I started to go back up again. But this time, I stopped it at 10,000 feet and rolled out, and I realized that I, I had learned how to control the airplane. Trainer can't control his plane's pitch as he usually does by pushing and pulling on his control column. Instead, by gently increasing and decreasing power to his engines, he seems to be able to keep his plane level. At that point, I've realized that my only pitch control was the throttle. The plane has descended to 10,000 feet. There's now enough oxygen to breathe. One zero zero. It's safe to remove our mask. Gear down before landing checklist. I headed directly for Saigon and uh, began a descent and began positioning myself for a final, much like you would in a glider. to these passengers, at the same time, I know we're in serious trouble. 
because the airplane is still going down. Captain Trainer has coaxed his injured jet down to just over 4,000 feet. 11 kilometers from the airport, he turns his jet to line up with the runway when his plane surprises him again. In the final turn to the runway, when I banked the airplane, the nose dropped and I couldn't continue my turn. I had to level the wings so that I had enough lift that the nose didn't keep descending. Captain Trainer had to stop turning before he could line up with the runway. He's now losing altitude fast, and his prospects are becoming increasingly grim. While we were working in the cargo compartment, the loadmaster came to me and said, we need to get upstairs because we're going to crash land. When I get to the top of the ladder, I've changed my mind and think, I need to be in the cargo compartment when this airplane does get on the runway so I can help evacuate down there. As I try to leave, the flight engineer grabs me by my left elbow, throws me into a seat, and about the time I hit the seat, I can hear the ground screaming. It's a loud scream. It's coming closer. Prepare for an imminent crash landing. Get down on the floor! Prepare for emergency landing! Mom, get down! When we started to go down, my mother and I were focusing on what should we be doing to brace for impact? We had a big open field in front of us. When I got within about 200 feet of the ground, I said, we're going in. The plane is hurtling towards the ground at almost 500 kilometers per hour. I reached down, grabbed my seatbelt, and when the seatbelt snaps, the ground relatively easily, and we popped back in the air. The jump seat said to me, Bud, we're going to make it. But I could see looming ahead of me was this huge, huge river. So I added power. My mom was on one side of the aisle, and I was on the other. And she says, come over here and sit with me. Even with full power at that point, I was still continuing to, to sink. slow motion. The airplane is coming apart where I'm sitting. All kinds of debris is flying through the air. And it went on and on and on. It seemed like forever. When I was going upside down, I remember saying, you know, goodbye to my wife a couple of times, because I was a god. And then, it was quiet. When the plane came to a stop, I looked for my mom. I didn't see her anywhere. At that point, it was all a little bit surreal that I didn't even really know what had just happened. All I knew was that we needed to get the babies out of there.
Reyna and the rest of the cockpit crew have survived. When I stepped out of the window, what was clear after you looked around, the, the airplane broke up into its component parts. The tail dropped off, uh, the flight deck broke away, the troop compartment and the wings, they separated from the cargo compartment. The cargo compartment itself disintegrated, essentially. Behind the cockpit, the plane's wings, which hold the fuel tanks, are burning. The passenger section of the plane is largely intact and separated from the scorching heat of the burning wings. Lieutenant Wurtz and many others who had been in the passenger section survive. Then we started bringing babies out. And I could hear some helicopters coming. At that point, I was not looking for my mother because I had been assured that she was okay. I was to go to the hospital and just wait for her there. And then that's when I took a couple of the babies and walked over and got on. A day that began with the promise of hope has ended in disaster. Just minutes after the crash of the first baby lift mission, rescue workers are on the scene searching for survivors. Almost everyone in the cargo area was killed instantly when the plane slammed down the second time. The dead, the injured, and the survivors are taken to hospitals in Saigon and Thailand. Since I was not injured, I just took a seat and was waiting for my mother while they brought in a lot of the babies. Then somebody came over to me and told me that my mother had died. I remember holding on for dear life. So she said, come over here and sit with me. Barb Adams' last decision was to be near her daughter. Just as I sat down on the floor, we must have hit. She flew forward somewhere. And that's the last time I saw my mother. One hundred and seventy-five people survived the crash of the Air Force jet. But more than one hundred and fifty have been killed. More than half of them were children. And it was really such a, a blow in what had already been a very tragic and sad story of the collapse of South Vietnam. And then who would have thought that in the middle of all that tragedy that the American Air Force would crash a plane full of Vietnamese babies and, and small children. The investigation begins immediately. The next day, along with the investigators, Captain Bud Trainer returns to the smoldering wreckage of his plane on a special mission of his own. I had to leave a couple of crew members out at the aircraft. And so I went back the next morning. The bodies of two dead crewmen are still pinned down by the wreckage. So we took a lot of tie-down chains and put them together and did the old heave-ho with a whole lot of people to move the flap of wreckage that was pinning the two crew members. And we got them out of there. It's always important to finish the job, and we did. But then I had a very naive approach to what was going to happen next. I kind of envisioned the guys in the silver helmets and put out the white rope. This is going to be a secure site. And that was when I got the shock that, hey, there are no guards out here. There's a Vietnamese soldier going through my suitcase wearing my flight jacket. And 
and he had an AR-15, and I didn't. That's my jacket. I'm Bud Trainer. And we established that my coat had the same name on it. That's mine. As my flight suit. And so the coat he was wearing was mine. So he begrudgingly gave me my coat and then proceeded to go through the rest of my suitcase. It's not only Trainer's jacket, looters are picking the plane clean. Dave Scheiding is a structural engineer with the Air Force. When we got to the site, uh, we had some concern to begin with because there was a, a tremendous amount of civilian people out there actually picking up parts, which of course that didn't help us much as far as the investigation goes. He's part of a team that goes to Saigon to try to figure out why the plane crashed. This investigation was very unique uh, from a couple of standpoints. The first standpoint, of course, the people taking parts away from us, but second, the country was in extreme chaos. It was essentially falling. Frank Huskin is also part of the investigative team. The NVA and the VidCong are all around, and we were only out there during the daytime, but it was a very uncomfortable feeling, very uncomfortable feeling. One of the first things we wanted to rule out was sabotage in a bomb. So we, we brought in dog, dogs from the Philippines, uh, bomb-sniffing dogs. Take him back there to the rear of the plane. With North Vietnamese soldiers so close, a direct attack or sabotage are obvious theories. Initially, they had all thought that it had been a bomb placed in the luggage compartment or it, hit, it had been a, a missile that shot the plane down. During the rush to board the aircraft, personal luggage was loaded but not thoroughly checked. This added to the speculation that a bomb may have been smuggled on board. The dogs find no trace of a bomb, and investigators find no evidence of explosive residue on the plane. It clearly wasn't attacked but something had caused the cargo door to fail. We had to find the doors, if at all possible, to make sure that we didn't have a problem with other C-5s that would cause this type of crash. Soon, the massive C-5As will be desperately needed to get America out of Vietnam. Finding out what happened to this one couldn't be more urgent. It was beyond important. At the time, we had approximately 100 C-5 aircraft. We grounded the C-5s until such time that we could figure out, one, what the problem was, and two, what were we going to do to prevent it from happening again. Hey, guys. As they examine the wreckage, Investigators also try to find out why the crew had such difficulty controlling the plane. Look how this is sheared off. The cables that Ray Snedeker saw leaking hydraulic fluid were the ones that controlled the plane's elevator. Since the elevator controls pitch, Captain Trainer had no way of guiding his plane up and down. Cargo bay! Declare an emergency. Saigon. Emergency. Emergency. to bay. When uh, there's no control of the elevator, which allows for up and down pitch, uh, an airplane will set up an oscillation up and down. His oscillation started as his nose was going down, and then it picked up speed, and then it started pitching up. A falling plane's aerodynamic properties will force it to follow a predictable pattern. As lift increases, the nose naturally tilts upwards. Without the elevators to counteract the motion, it will continue until the plane moves so slowly that it stalls, falling back to the ground. It explains the strange motion of the giant C-5A. By adjusting the thrust to his engines, Trainer was able to keep the jet from rising and falling. 
Investigators believe the cables were sheared off when the cargo door exploded from the plane. But they still don't know why the door failed in the first place. Then we made the determination we were going to have to try and find the doors. But the doors are somewhere at the bottom of the South China Sea. Our next problem was trying to figure out the ballistics of those doors. Nobody had ever even thought of figuring out ballistics of two doors flying through the air from 23,000 feet. Relying on the airspeed and the altitude at the moment of decompression, investigators learned the plane was 46 kilometers from the coast of Vietnam. When the doors went out, the airplane was moving across the water at about 600 feet per second. Therefore, we had to come down with a pretty good estimate for the Navy to even know where to look. Ships from the US 7th Fleet crisscrossed the South China Sea looking for the rear door. For the first several days, they can't find anything. The South China Sea has swallowed the evidence. At the crash site, investigators are becoming increasingly frustrated. A great deal of wreckage has been stolen by scavengers. An important clue could be among the pieces taken away. To retrieve these parts, the Air Force offers to buy them back. The strategy was to provide leaflets throughout the city of Saigon and the surrounding area. We want every piece of material from the aircraft back, and we will also pay you if you will turn this in to us. Eleven days after the crash, flyers are delivered to local officials and distributed throughout the city. Investigators do eventually recover the camera that was used by a film crew on board the plane. They hope it can show them exactly what happened. But the film inside the camera has already been removed. Another piece of the wreck turned in during the buyback program is just what they're looking for. We were trying to get the black boxes back because that's the thing we really wanted. All C-5As are fitted with a computer system that records vital information about the plane's operation. It records engine settings, airspeed, altitude, and hundreds of other parameters onto a magnetic tape. The system is called MADAR, Malfunction Detection Analysis and Recording System. It wasn't found at the crash site. The MADAR is eventually returned for a reward, but it proves to be a disappointment. It didn't identify the reason for the doors and the ramps failing, but it did provide us a sequence of events in a lot of areas, including altitude, airspeed, uh, the performance of the aircraft itself uh, during that time frame. As investigators continue to look for the cause of the crash, the situation in Vietnam gets worse. Two days after they receive the MADAR, the South Vietnamese president resigns. On April the 23rd, 100,000 North Vietnamese troops approach Saigon. The noose around the city is tightening quickly. While we were out in the rice paddy, you could see burning hamlets and villages, and in the distance, they were on fire. You could hear the explosions and so forth, of mortars. While the situation in Vietnam continues to unravel, the US Navy finally has some success at sea. On April the 26th, they find the cargo ramp and part of the pressure door of Trainer's plane. If investigators don't find the answers here, they may not find them anywhere. They're running out of time, and they're running out of leads. When the ramp is examined, investigators make a disturbing discovery. 
On that ramp, two of the stirrups were in, in great condition. They were perfect. Uh, they had not failed, so obviously it told us that at least two of the locks had just unlocked themselves. The C5A has 14 locks holding the rear cargo door shut, seven on each side. The door recovered from the sea tells investigators that for some reason, three of the locks designed to hold it shut had either unlocked in flight or had never locked at all. This flight was actually like a ticking bomb. When they closed the ranks, all those locks would look like they were in a locked position. When it took off, the, the fuse was lit. And as the aircraft climbed out, the fuse kept burning. As the plane climbed away from Saigon, the pressure outside the jet dropped. The air inside pushed with increasing force against the cargo door. Then, as the plane passed through 23,000 feet, with three latches unlocked, the pressure on the door was too much. With the three locks that failed all in a row, it was just too much load for the other four locks to, to actually pick up, and which resulted in the catastrophic failure of the ramp itself. But investigators still don't know why the locks failed. Before they can find the answer, the situation in Vietnam deteriorates completely. Saigon is under siege. On April the 27th, the investigators take all of the evidence they can and leave. It's simply too dangerous to stay. When we left Saigon, uh, we were the last two C-141s to leave Tonson Air Base. They were essentially losing their country at that time, and uh, after that, it was only helicopters that got out. Investigators hope they have all the clues they need to solve the mystery of the crash. They know they won't be coming back to Vietnam to look for any more. April the 30th, 1975. The war in Vietnam ends. From the rooftop of the American Embassy, the last remaining Americans in Vietnam are flown to safety. Back in the United States, investigators continue their work. Since the C-5 is in service around the world, they need to know why three locks on the cargo door failed. When we got back to Texas, it was to help us verify the failure sequence. Investigators discover something potentially alarming about the cargo plane's rear door. Parts from the C-5A were actually removed from the plane, cannibalized to service another cargo plane. The locks on the rear door of the C-5A are connected to each other by a series of tie rods the rods can be lengthened or shortened to ensure the locks are completely closed. It's these tie rods which were removed from the babylift plane. At the time, the enormous cargo planes were in constant demand. The Air Force was very short of parts, and so they came up with a uh, standard practice uh, for maintenance that they could cannibalize parts off of aircrafts that are not being flown. It's authorized and it, it's a good operation if, if you respect it and treat it properly. The tie rods were replaced before the baby lift plane left for Saigon, but for some reason they hadn't held. To try to figure out what happened, investigators rebuild one of the locks that was supposed to keep the rear door closed. We essentially built a working model of that ramp and we had to do that because we didn't get all the parts back because of the people picking them up, parts out in the ocean and everything that we never got back. Investigators aren't convinced that the problem is in the basic design of the lock. They suspect that before the plane left California, the engineers who replaced the rods didn't follow the proper procedures. When we're talking about the, the, the locks, the distances that we're talking about are very, very small. We could be talking about a 16th, 32nd of an inch uh, difference uh, between being locked and unlocked. The re-rigging was done before the plane left the United States. Show me how you re-rig it. After the locks were re-rigged, they should have checked to make sure they were working. That wasn't done. Without the check, no one would have noticed that the re-rigging was done improperly. I would say that the, this accident actually started 
uh, back at Travis Air Force Base in California. When the two tie rods that had been cannibalized earlier were replaced, they were not installed properly. Loadmaster closed cargo bay doors. When the door was opened and shut in Saigon, there was a warning that not everything was perfect. We had some difficulty getting it to lock, so we had to open and close it three, four times. But it seemed to be routine, and in the heat of the moment, we didn't, we didn't think anything about it. But 12 minutes after liftoff, as the plane continued to climb, the three improperly closed locks were forced open by the building air pressure. The remaining locks could not take the extra load. The cargo door burst open and was torn off the fuselage. You just can't take shortcuts. And if it's pulled a couple of rods out, run out and put them back in, that's not going to hack it. The investigators have found their answers and in their final report make specific recommendations that will make the C-5A safer. As a result, the Air Force designs a pin that slips through each lock. If the door isn't properly shut, the pins can't slide into place. We essentially Murphy-proofed it by putting steel pins in there so that when the lock is in the over-center position, if you can insert these safety pins, then you know that the, the system is properly rigged. Ray Snedeker retired from the Air Force as a Chief Master Sergeant. This mission was probably the most discouraging in some ways based on part of the outcome. But also, it was refreshing in the fact that, that we displayed such good airmanship, such courage, and we were able to save so many people. After 28 years of service, Bud Trainer retired from the Air Force as a colonel. I think everyone second guesses themselves to see if there was something else that they could do. I am very fortunate in that I never found something that I said, I sure wish I had done X. It just wasn't there. That pilot did a, a super job. The fact that anybody survived this crash is, is just remarkable. The ones that were saved are very fortunate that that particular crew uh, was in charge of that aircraft. Being a pilot myself and knowing they only had a, one aileron and four engines, uh, by rights, they all should have been dead. The investigation board does not normally recommend decorations. That's not part of their job. But in this case, we recommended to the Air Force that they be considered for a high decoration. Surviving crew members, including Captain Bud Trainer and Sergeant Ray Snedeker, were awarded medals by the Air Force for heroism and extraordinary achievement. One of the orphans that survived was baby Ina. Ina? Today, she's known as Kelly Jackson Brownlee. April 4th, 1975. It's definitely a pivotal point in my life where I left part of myself behind in Vietnam. When Operation Baby Lift resumed, Kelly, along with hundreds of other orphans, were flown to the United States. She was eventually adopted by a family near Seattle, Washington. There was a 25-year anniversary in April of 2000, and it brought together all of the adults that were adopted from Vietnam. And I ended up meeting uh, someone who was very special and actually ended up marrying. Chris Brownlee and his wife, Kelly, were both airlifted out of Vietnam on April the 5th, 1975 one day after the crash. Pull down and turn to your right. 
If you force it, you'll break it. This won't come out, Bob. Push the switch forward. A single light bulb is preventing a modern jetliner from landing. Screwing around with a 20 cent piece of light equipment on this plane. Struggling to fix a minor problem, a much more serious one develops. We're still at 2000, right? Hey, hey, what's happening here? The plane crashes in a remote swamp. Those who survive the crash face a new danger. The swamp has filled with jet fuel. No one light a match! Eastern 401 was a pivotal accident in aviation history. The crash would point investigators to an astonishing danger lurking in all commercial cockpits. December 29th, 1972, the dawn of the jumbo jet era. On its way to Florida, this L-1011 TriStar is the most advanced passenger jet in the world. The Lucky TriStar was a fascinating bird. It was a beautifully flying airplane. It had a tremendous amount of power uh, and a lot of innovation to it. The cabin of this Eastern Airlines jet is large and quiet. The service is first rate. Bob Loft is the captain for Eastern Airlines Flight 401. He's been with the airline for more than 30 years. His first officer is Albert Stockstill. His second officer is Donald Repo. The jet has left the bitter cold of New York behind and is now descending towards Miami. Welcome to Miami. The temperature's in the low 70s and it's a beautiful night out there tonight. Go ahead and throw him out. Angelo Donadeo is an off-duty Eastern Airlines maintenance expert. He's catching a ride back to Miami. There are 176 people on board tonight's flight. Most are heading south for New Year's. Ron and Lily Infantino have been married for only 20 days. They've just spent Christmas with his family. The seatbelt sign came on as normal. We're in a final approach. I look out the window there, and uh, I could see lights at the airport. Close to midnight, the plane begins its approach to Miami International Airport. Stock still flies the plane, while Repo performs a landing checklist. Radar, up, off. Hydraulic panels checked, 35, 33. Gear down. The captain notices a problem. Bird, is that handling? No nose gear. The light showing that the nose gear is locked hasn't lit up. I'm gonna raise it back up. The gear might not be all the way down. Loft tries again. The sound of the landing gear echoes through the plane. It makes a pretty loud grinding noise. If you've flown very much, you're familiar with that sound. So they did that several times. The pilots did that several times. And we weren't alarmed. It's just one of those things that happens sometimes. And we just kind of looked at each other and said, great, we're going to be late getting home. Still no light. Loft isn't sure if his front landing gear is locked. If it isn't, landing could be disastrous. Uh, tower, this is Eastern uh, 401. Looks like we're gonna have to circle. We don't have a light on our nose gear yet. Eastern 401 heavy, roger. Pull up, climb straight ahead to 2000. Go back to approach control, 128.6. You want me to test the lights or not? Yeah, check it. Flight engineer Repo performs a test nicknamed the Christmas tree. It lights up every warning light in the cockpit to see if the bulbs are working. The nose gear indicator light fails the test. The bulb is probably burnt out. 
but there's a slim chance of a double failure. Both the light bulb and the landing gear could be broken. Uh, Bob, could you just jiggle the light? But the troublesome bulb is out of the captain's reach. On the ground, air traffic control directs flight 401 to climb to 2,000 feet and circle away from the airport until the problem is solved. You want me to fly? Yeah. Uh, what uh, frequency did he want us on, bud? 128.6. Uh, talk to him. It's right above that red one. Isn't yeah, it? I can't get at it from here. Wow. Yeah, I can't make a pull out either. It's a moonless night. As the plane veers away from Miami, there's total darkness outside. All of a sudden, it turned uh, pitch dark again. And that means we were going back out west towards the Everglades. Co-pilot Stockstill is flying the plane, but Captain Loft needs his help to solve the problem. Put the autopilot on here. Right. The TriStar is equipped with the most sophisticated autopilot in history. It actually has the ability to land the plane on its own. Stockstill programs it to fly at 2,000 feet. Now, see if you can get that light out. The light is finally removed. Richard Pragluski is an aviation engineer. He takes this flight regularly and can tell that the plane is experiencing technical problems. He was heading out towards the Everglades. I knew there was something wrong with the plane because they, if you have a delay, they'll circle the plane. The irritating problem isn't getting better. Now, stock still can't get the light back in. Now, push the switch just forward. Uh, okay. You got it sideways then. Eastern 401, turn left, heading 300. Okay, 300, Eastern 401. Hey, hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel is down. The electronics bay on the plane is underneath the cockpit. The room, nicknamed the hellhole, is a unique feature on wide-bodied jets. The front landing gear mechanism can be seen from there. You got a handkerchief or something so I can get a little better grip Hold on this? Hold down and turn to your right. Anything I can do with? Yeah. Turn to your left one time. Get down there and see if that damn this thing... This won't come out, Bob. If I had a pair of pliers, I could cushion it with that cleaner. I can give you a pair of pliers, but if you force it, you'll break it. Just put it... <sighs> to hell with it! To hell with this! Get down and see if we're lined up with that red line. That's all we care. Screwing around with a 20 cent piece of light equipment on this plane. <laughs> As the crew struggles to fix the problem, in the cabin, Richard Pregluski sees something peculiar out of his window. I could see a tower to my right in the distance, and it looked like we were going into a glide path, which I found very strange. Pragluski has noticed something the pilots haven't. The plane is getting closer and closer to the swamp below. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 is flying over the Florida Everglades. Below it, nothing but a dark, deserted swamp. To passenger Richard Pragluski, something doesn't seem right. I feel it kind of strange that they hadn't made any announcements. But again, he was still fairly high off the ground. And I figured they would come out and tell us that when they were going to make the landing. So I wasn't overly concerned. Put it in the wrong way, huh? Looks square to me. Can't you get the hole lined up? I don't know what the hell's holding that damn thing in there. It's always something. We could have made schedule. Without a green light, they still don't know if their landing gear is locked. Flight engineer Don Repo is now in the belly of the plane. There's a viewing window in the hellhole which should let him see if the front wheels are locked in place. I don't see it down there. Huh? I don't see it. It's not lined up. I can't see it. It 
it's pitch dark, and I throw the little light and get nothing. Wheel wheel lights on? Pardon? Wheel wheel lights on? Captain Loft has forgotten to turn on lights outside the plane that illuminate the landing gear. Now try it. Miami International, controller Charlie Johnson has just finished dealing with another troubled jet. National 607 has landed without incident. Fire trucks were deployed, but they weren't used. He notices that Eastern Airlines Flight 401 seems to have dropped from 2,000 feet to 900. But he's not overly concerned. It's not unusual to get false readings for several radar sweeps in a row. Eastern 401, uh, how are things coming along out there? OK, uh, we'd like to uh, turn around and come, um, uh, come back in. Captain Loft believes that he'll soon get confirmation that his gear is locked. He wants to return to the airport. Eastern 401, turn left, heading 180. The plane is heading west, away from the airport. It will take several minutes to get lined up for the landing. Deep in the Everglades, Bob Marcus is hunting frogs with a friend. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 roars past. Okay, I just saw the, saw the lights blinking across the sky, and it was just a black. There's no horizon in, in the west, and uh, you, could tell, you couldn't tell how high the plane was. Suddenly, the pilots make an alarming observation. We did something to the altitude? What? We're still at 2,000, right? Hey, hey, what's happening here? lights in the cabin just flickering on and off and I heard a noise. There was a violent, I mean, a violent whipping sensation. Then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Charlie Johnson notices that Flight 401's altitude now reads as coastal or sea level. Eastern uh, 401, I lost you on the radar there, your transponder. What's your altitude now? There's no response from Eastern 401. Another plane makes a disturbing report. Miami approach, this is National 611. We just saw a big flash, it looked like it came out west. Don't know what it means, but wanted to let you know. In a dark, remote swamp, those who survived the crash find themselves in a nightmare. Bob Marcus races towards the site of the crash. Oh, I was going as fast as I could. It took me about 15 minutes, I think, to get to the crash site. Remarkably, Richard Pregluski is alive. I knew I was badly injured because I could see my clothes hanging from my body. I had almost no clothes in my upper half of the body, and I could see skin coming down my arms. And I also knew that when you're in shock, you feel no pain. So I knew I really was seriously injured. And I started thinking, I said, well, you know, the pain will come later, but how do I keep calm and get out of there because the longer I'm in that swamp, and the condition I'm in, the more danger I'm in. When the plane crashed, a huge fireball tore through the cabin. 
I remember that fire coming to my face. I remember the flash. I remember that I tried breathing and I could not get my breath. Of course, the fire took all the oxygen out of the air. And that's the last thing I remember until I got up in the swamp itself. Ron Infantino was knocked out by the crash. He wakes up in the swamp. So I was thrown quite a bit. And I was away from I didn't know everybody else. Nobody was even near me. Lily. Lily. He's badly wounded. His new wife, Lily, was sitting next to him, but now she's nowhere to be seen. Swamp water doused the initial flames. But 20,000 kilograms of jet fuel has now leaked into the swamp. A single spark could start a deadly blaze. No one light a match. We're covered in jet fuel. What a sad thing to come through that crash and then have somebody do something stupid like strike a match and have us all just blow up. That was the real fear. Hoping to help the survivors, Bob Marcus jumps into the swamp. He immediately feels the sting of the jet fuel on his skin. It burnt my legs. I had to treat my legs for, for burns for about a week. Marcus quickly spots a survivor who's in grave danger. The badly wounded man is still strapped to his seat. He's on the verge of drowning. And his head kept dropping down in the water. He came up, he said, help me. <laughs> I can't hold my head up much longer and then drop back down in the water. So I helped him, I pulled him up. Don't worry, I got you, I got you. Bob Marcus saves dozens of lives, preventing many people from drowning. Isolated from the other survivors and unable to move, Ron Infantino now has a new reason to fear for his life. After a while, the alligators and the snakes, you could hear them in the weeds coming by, and you could hear the, the croaking of the alligators because they started to come back to the natural habitat. And as far as I'm concerned, if a gator came up to me or a snake, I was dead meat because I couldn't defend myself at all. And then I heard Christmas caroling. To rally the survivors' spirits, Trudy Smith and others sing Christmas carols. We knew instinctively that we weren't going to get out of there in a hurry because nobody knew where we were. In the middle of the swamp, midnight. So what else are you going to do? And you got to picture us this, I mean, in the dark at night, or you hear us singing in the wilderness. It was like you're on the Titanic going down type of thing, you know? It was unbelievable. Within minutes, Coast Guard helicopters are sent out in search of the crash site. But in the pitch black night, they can't find the wreckage. Bob Marcus tries to signal the distant helicopters. But I could see where they were and they were going the wrong direction. And I, I just waved the light at them until I saw them turn and head back towards us. It seemed like we'd been in the swamps for a really long time when we heard a helicopter and, and it was such a welcoming sound because that means somebody knows that you're there. Less than half an hour after the crash, the Coast Guard arrives. But the nearest landing site is 100 meters away. 
Marcus rushes to meet the helicopter and ferry the rescuers back to the crash site. His first passenger is rescue worker Don Schneck. I made it to the airboat. He asked me, where are all the rescuers? And I said, this is it, let's go. He took us out into the glades to a point where he said, this is as far as I want to go because I don't want to run anybody over. And he said, there are bodies out here all over the place. Don Schneck starts searching for survivors. I approached the large object that I had seen at a sl small distance and realized it was the nose section of the aircraft. <coughs> He's amazed to discover that Captain Bob Loft has survived the crash. He was in bad shape. He had lacerations, so I knew he had broken ribs. I could tell he was in shock, so I calmed him down, told him, I'm the only one here right now, but they're coming. Just hang in there. I'm going to die. He told me that, and I argued with him. Anything to keep his, anything going. It, it just made me feel so inadequate because it was just me. I turned around and I looked back towards Miami and thinking, where in the heck is everybody? And at that time when I looked, I must have seen 50 lights coming. And I went, thank God. First officer Bert Stockstill was killed during the crash. Captain Bob Loft soon dies at the scene. Angelo Donadeo and Don Repo have survived and are taken to hospital. In all, 77 people survive the crash. 99 people are killed. By dawn, all the wounded have been transported to Miami hospitals. Ron Infantino is one of the many who are struggling to survive. The priest comes over and does the last rites. So right then I knew I was in bad shape. And it's a scary thought. And of course at that time, I'm still asking for Lily, you know, have they seen her? It was such a madhouse there that night, you could imagine. Lily. Where's Lily? The crash is headline news around the world. It's the first ever jumbo jet to crash, and it produces the largest number of deaths in US civil aviation history. There's tremendous pressure on investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board to find out what happened. It was an enormous puzzle because this was the newest, the most sophisticated, the best of the airliners that apparently was in perfect working condition. So the NTSB perceived that this was going to be a very long investigation that involved multi-level potential problems. The crash site itself is an important clue for investigators arriving at the scene. The trail of debris is enormously long. That suggests that the plane hit the swamp almost in the same nose-up position as it would while landing at an airport. Its descent was clearly slow and gradual. NTSB investigators have documented the final settings for many of the instruments in the cockpit. They discover that the autopilot was set to maintain an altitude of 2,000 feet. So why didn't it? Maintenance expert Angelo Donadeo is interviewed. All he can tell investigators is the crew was trying to fix a light bulb before the crash. Within days, the plane's two black boxes are recovered. Investigators hope they will provide some answers. Before they can extract the data, flight engineer Don Repo dies in hospital. 
Ron Infantino is given some devastating news of his own. The body of his wife Lily has been found under the plane's wing. She's just a wonderful person. I was 27 years old, and she was the same age, and uh, it was actually my first love. Infantino is haunted by the memory of switching seats with Lily just before the crash. They had swapped seats quite casually earlier during the flight when she had gotten up to go to the restroom. She was thrown into the swamp and drowned, and he lived. The swamp proves both a blessing and a curse for survivors. That's what saved most of the lives, actually. Because the plane broke up, it absorbed all the energy. And the mud absorbed it, and the plane just dispersed. The swamp water is so thick with mud, it also clogs survivors' wounds, preventing many from bleeding to death. But there's a deadly new threat facing some survivors. Their wounds have become infected, contaminated by a deadly organism found in the black mud of the Everglades. The organism produces an infection called gas gangrene. It can kill a person in just two days. Gas gangrene can only be destroyed in a hyperbaric chamber. It's a pressurized container that gets filled with high levels of oxygen. The oxygen gets forced into the wounds and kills the bacteria. Eight of the surviving passengers are infected with gas gangrene. Hyperbaric chambers must be found for all of them. The only other way to save patients is to amputate the infected limb. Ron Infantino's arm is badly infected. The doctor came in and says, well, we've diagnosed it as gas gangrene. He says, we got to take your arm off immediately or I have to get you to a hyperbaric chamber. Unfortunately, he says, the only hyperbaric chamber is at Mercy Hospital, and that's all been taken advantage of. Unless doctors can find a chamber soon, Infantino will lose his arm. While doctors search for a chamber for Ron Infantino, investigators examine what's left of the plane. They test its flight controls, engines, instruments, and its electrical and hydraulic systems. The plane was virtually new. It was in perfect condition. There was no mechanical reason found that would have caused the crash. In fact, some parts of the plane are in such good condition that the NTSB gives them back to Eastern Airlines so they can be installed on other airplanes in its fleet. An unused hyperbaric chamber is finally found for Ron Infantino at a Navy base in Panama City. He spends 40 hours in the chamber. The pressurized oxygen kills the bacteria and saves his life. Gentlemen, we have three causes of the crash to explore. A state-of-the-art jetliner plunged 2,000 feet without the crew noticing. Investigators know the plane was mechanically sound. They now focus on other possible reasons for the unobserved descent. At the top of the list is subtle incapacitation of the pilot. The autopsy of Captain Bob Loft has yielded a gruesome discovery. Captain Loft had a large, undetected tumor growing in his brain. It pressed into the part of his brain responsible for sight. Medical records reveal that between the ages of 50 and 52, vision in the pilot's left eye had rapidly deteriorated. Doctors believe that the captain may have had reduced peripheral vision. The tumor could have created blind spots. As his attention became focused on the malfunctioning light, he may not have noticed dire warnings on his altimeter. Investigators consider a stunning possibility. 
An undetected medical ailment may have contributed to the world's first jumbo jet disaster. We're still at 2,000, right? Hey, hey, what's happening here? Investigators learn what they can about Captain Bob Loft. They interview people who knew him and pore over his medical records. The investigators heard that Captain Loft, so far as his family and friends knew, had perfect vision. He was an expert marksman. He shot dubs, particularly, which are a very small target. Loft's records show that he'd recently passed a medical in which he was issued corrective glasses for flying. But the evidence doesn't support the notion that his vision was dangerously impaired. He was 55 years old, and who gets to be 55 without wearing reading glasses? Not many. Dr. Joe Davis, who did the autopsy, told me that even though the tumor was pressing on areas of his brain that control vision, there was no reason to think that it had yet begun to affect those. He felt it had nothing to do with the accident. Investigators still don't know why Flight 401 started descending in the first place. Put the autopilot on here. Right. Could the autopilot, which was supposed to keep the plane at 2,000 feet, have malfunctioned? The plane's computers survived the crash. They're removed and examined. 11 days after the crash, the autopilot computers are installed on another TriStar. It flies the same route as Flight 401. The autopilot holds that plane at 2,000 feet. So why hadn't it on the night of the accident? Investigators will need to explore other leads to find out. There's another question that dogs this investigation. Why didn't the Miami Tower alert the crew that their plane was dropping? The world's first three-dimensional radar had recently been installed there. It meant that controller Charlie Johnson knew the location, altitude, and speed of Flight 401. National 607 is declaring... Investigators the study recordings of Johnson's right conversations... Fire and ambulance sent out right away. ...and discover that on the night of the crash, it was another plane that demanded most of his attention. National Airlines Flight 607 was coming into land just ahead of Flight 401. That flight was having its own landing gear problems. Emergency runway 9 will need fire and ambulance sent out right away. As he focused on the emergency, Johnson handed Flight 401 over to another controller. But just as National 607 came in for its emergency landing, the other controller phoned Johnson and handed Flight 401 back to him. High Eastern Heavy's coming back to you. Unsafe nose gear. Uh, no. At the time, Flight 401 was already over the swamp. Johnson had five other planes to monitor. He was also dealing with the aftermath of his emergency landing. National 607 has landed without incident. The trucks were That's forward. when he noticed that Flight 401's altitude had dropped to 900 feet. The way the radar has worked, still to a certain extent this happens, but back then it was even worse. Coast mode was a very well-known phenomenon. I mean, you might lose the target for two or three minutes in terms of the altitude reporting part of it, and it goes and gives you some weird altitude, and then boom, it's right back where it should be. But the controller didn't stop there, and this was really to his credit. Johnson decided to make contact with Flight 401. Eastern 401, uh, how are things coming along? OK, uh, we'd like to uh, turn around and come, uh, uh, come back in. Eastern 401, turn left, heading 180. After that brief exchange, Johnson assumed there was no problem. Eastern 401, uh, how are things coming along? OK. Uh, Investigators conclude that at that moment, Controller Johnson was the only one who could see that the plane was losing altitude. Why hadn't he passed that information along to the crew? U.S. government regulations for air traffic controllers provide the answer. It simply wasn't part of a controller's job. 
At the time of the crash, the FAA required approach controllers to maintain a separation of the airplanes. It did not give them a duty to maintain the altitude of the airliner with regard to the ground. Now investigators try to determine how the plane's own warning system failed to alert pilots to their growing danger. The L-1011 is equipped with an alarm that sounds if the plane goes 250 feet above or below the altitude selected by the pilots. As investigators replay the tape from the black box, they clearly hear that alarm sounding in the cockpit as the plane passed through 1,750 feet. Do you hear that? How did they miss it? Investigators closely examine the cockpit transcript to try to understand how the alarm was missed. Put it in the wrong way, huh? Swear to me. Investigators notice that just before the alarm sounded in the cockpit, warning the crew that the plane is too low, both pilots were completely absorbed with the landing gear light. The conversation also tells investigators that the flight engineer was below in the hellhole. The warning chime came out of a speaker at his workstation. Investigators begin to realize that the two pilots were unable to hear a perfectly audible alarm because they were focused so entirely on solving another problem. That chime, which is clearly heard on the uh, cockpit voice recorder, was not registering in the minds of all the men on that flight deck. Not because they weren't trying to pay attention, but because they were tunneled in on this one problem. That's what we do as humans. Investigators now focus on crew distraction as a likely cause of this accident. Several instruments would have displayed the decreasing altitude. The major question was, why were the pilots so preoccupied that they were not looking at the instrument panel? They had to look at the human beings. They had to look at the interaction. They had to look at why no one was paying attention to the airplane as it began to creep out at 2,000 feet. That was scary territory in 1972. Investigators interview a number of pilots and make a startling discovery. Pilots admitted that they placed a lot of trust in the modern new autopilots flying their planes. They may have become overly dependent on the technology. Put the autopilot on here. Right. Investigators suspect that the Eastern crew was so confident in their autopilot that they didn't monitor their instruments as closely as they should have. Now, see if you can get that light out. Once the autopilot was on, none of the pilots paid attention to actually flying the plane. Still got to find out why that plane went down. Investigators still haven't determined the most crucial piece of information. If the autopilot was working, why did the plane dive into the swamp? We did something to the altitude? What? The pilot's conversation clearly shows that they hadn't deliberately started descending. We're still at 2,000, right? Hey, hey, what's happening here? So why did it happen? The answer comes in a dramatic form when the NTSB conducts a public hearing in Miami two months after the crash. Before the hearing, an Eastern Airlines pilot named Daniel Gellert wrote the chairman of the NTSB offering to testify on his own behalf. He had flown the TriStar L-1011 and noticed some abnormalities. The world of airline piloting in 1972 was hostile to a pilot going around his chief pilot in his airline and raising his hand to the NTSB and saying, hey, wait a minute, I've had an experience too, because airlines were far more insular than they are today. Gellert tells the hearing that during a recent flight on a TriStar, he had accidentally dropped a map on the cockpit floor. As he bent down to pick it up, he nudged his control column. He noticed immediately that the plane's autopilot had been affected. The part of the autopilot controlling altitude had been turned off. The NTSB discovers that Gellert's experience is shared by others. In fact, 17 days after the accident, 
Eastern Airlines tacked a notice onto a company bulletin board and also mailed it to all of its TriStar pilots. The bulletin warned against accidentally bumping the control wheel. One of the things that we built into all the modern jetliners and airliners is simply a pressure switch. So if you, if you need to take over right now, you don't want to be wasting time down here on the panel turning the autopilot off. You just grab it and the autopilot goes away. The flight data recorder tells investigators the precise moment that the plane's altitude started to drop. It was 11.37 and 8 seconds. By studying the voice recorder transcript, investigators can tell what was happening in the cockpit at that exact time. Hey, hey, get down there and see if that damn nose wheel is down. By turning to speak to the flight engineer, investigators believe that Captain Loft bumped his control wheel. He did it with just enough pressure to disengage that part of the autopilot that had been controlling the plane's altitude. Without anyone realizing it, a simple nudge of the control wheel started a gradual descent. On a dark, moonless night, the pilots had no visual cues to tell them they were falling. It was determined that occasionally, with just a soft bump, an autopilot had been disengaged. So before the crash, it wasn't part of the training. A training director for Eastern Airlines eventually reveals that before the Everglades crash, pilots were never taught that a bump could disengage the autopilot. The NTSB comes to a sobering conclusion. The plane crash was due to pilot error. The crew was distracted. They mishandled the plane's sophisticated automation, and they hadn't been properly trained. Eastern 401 was a pivotal accident in aviation safety history. And, and we really didn't know this for about 10 or 15 years in terms of the true import of what it did to us in focusing our attention on the fact that the way we handle things in a cockpit was not only not correct, but it was dangerous. Investigators also make a disheartening find. When the nose gear indicator light assembly is examined, they discover that a light bulb inside is burnt out. Go ahead and throw them out. Flight 401's landing gear was locked. The plane could have landed. The only piece of the plane that failed was a $12 light bulb. The full legacy of Flight 401 will take years to unfold. It will ultimately alter how pilots are trained and how accidents are investigated. But first, the tail of Eastern Airlines Flight 401 will take a very bizarre twist. As far as the NTSB is concerned, the investigation into Eastern Airlines Flight 401 is over. Several recommendations were laid out to prevent similar accidents. Those include new regulations instructing air traffic controllers to warn pilots when they're getting too close to the ground. But four years later, it became clear there was a bigger lesson to be learned from Eastern Airlines Flight 401. In 1977, two 747s collided on a runway in Tenerife on the Canary Islands. It was the deadliest plane crash of all time. And we're now at takeoff. OK, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. 736, report when runway clear. That accident was caused by a string of miscommunications in the cockpit. It did not go off, though. It did not go off before an American. Yeah, Investigators established that 70% of crashes were due to pilot error. Both of these accidents, uh, Tenerife and 401, what you see is, is crews dedicated to doing a good job, but not realizing that they're human, not realizing how many things can go wrong if you don't appreciate how human beings fail. By the late 1970s, NASA began to explore a new behavioral science designed to reduce pilot error. And uh, pilots be on the lookout for any different behavior when we fire. It's called crew resource management, or CRM. 
crew resource management simply means that we're not going to have one pilot leading and everybody else following. It means that the captain has to be a leader and listen to and interact with his subordinate crew members, and the subordinate crew members have to speak up. Decades later, Flight 401 is taught in aviation courses around the world as a textbook example of poor CRM. The problem was that we did not teach Bob Loft or Stockstill or any of these folks at the time that when something goes wrong, the commander's first responsibility is to maintain aircraft control and either do it himself or assign somebody. We're up to 2,000. You want me to fly, Bob? Uh, what uh, frequency did he want us on, Bert? 128.6. I'll talk to him. On Flight 401, Captain Loft did not clarify who should be doing what. Instead, all three crew members worked on the same problem. Uh, Bob, could you just jiggle the light? It's got to gotta come out a little bit and then snap in. With the co-pilot flying, the captain commanding from the left seat, you already had cross purposes here. It's right above that red one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can't get at it from here. And you had a light quadrant the captain couldn't quite reach. And the co-pilot could, but the co-pilot is flying the airplane. You've just set them up for a major problem. And guess what? Systemically, we never taught them what to do. Today, CRM also trains flight crews not to be intimidated by one crew member's mood. You got a handkerchief or something so I can get a little better grip on this? Anything I can do it with? Get down there and see if that damn this thing... This won't come out, Bob. So if the leader is having a problem, in this case, with a light bulb... Uh, OK. You got it sideways, then. And he's really fit. irritated at it, and the co-pilot has now made the problem worse. Co-pilot's not going to be happy with himself over that. I don't know what the hell's holding that damn thing in there. Don Repo is not going to be happy that he got downstairs to try to solve the problem, and he couldn't see anything, and he's got to come up and report that. I don't see it. They're all tense. It's not lined up. I can't see it. And when you get a crew like that tense, it's not turn, to turn around to the captain and say, you shouldn't have done that. But this is part of the evolution of what air safety has now learned and been able to teach so many other industries. The enduring legacy of Flight 401 is the delegation of specific tasks in the cockpit. The result is fewer crashes. There was also much more bizarre fallout from this crash. For a while, it seemed that the crew of Flight 401 was haunting other Eastern Airlines flights. For some time after the crash, flight crews and passengers report seeing lifelike apparitions of Flight 401's crew. Many of the ghost sightings were on aircraft fitted with recovered parts from Flight 401. The ghost stories spread quickly. One book devoted entirely to those stories suggests that the ghosts were there to protect passengers and crew from further mishap. The official reaction at Eastern Airlines uh, to these ghost stories was uh, one of uh, absolute eye-rolling denial in public and in private a certain bit of panic. There are so many ghost sightings that eventually Eastern Airlines removes Flight 401's cannibalized plane parts from all other aircraft. None of those who survived the crash will ever forget the horror they witnessed in the Everglades that night. And 35 years after their ordeal, many of them returned to that swamp to finally recognize the heroic efforts of Bob Marcus. We're here today to recognize and to say thank you. Many of the ones who lived, lived because Robert Marcus was there with his airboat. He saw them drowning and decided that the thing that he could do would be to save the ones he could save. Robert Marcus was the kind of person that I hope that all of us ultimately would be if we were confronted with that sort of thing. But he drew on some special courage to do what he did. He was one of the true heroes of the crash. In 1979, chaos 
when the FAA grounds every DC-10 in America. You can imagine if one of your real workhorse airplanes is grounded, it's a terrible situation. The reason... Look at this. American Airlines Flight 191. I'm losing it! All right, all right, come on, come on! It only got about 300 feet above the ground. What do you got? As investigators search for evidence... It's one of the bushing bolts. ...in the worst air disaster in U.S. history... Split right in two. There's the bolt. This is a fracture point. They face intense media pressure to identify the cause. Some very crucial photographs showed the aircraft on its final fatal plunge. The shocking images may finally explain... We need to see those slats. ...why 271 people died seconds after leaving the ground. Any updates on the weather? Surface wind, 20 degrees at 22 knots. Nothing but blue skies. On a Friday afternoon, the seasoned crew of American Airlines Flight 191... Rudder set. ...makes final preparations for takeoff. Spoilers arm. ...from Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Captain Walter Lux was scheduled to have the weekend off, but is covering for a friend. This crew was a very experienced crew. The uh, captain had approximately 22,000 hours of flying time, uh, of which about 3,000 hours were in the DC-10. So he was a very, very experienced pilot in the aircraft. The DC-10's three-engine layout makes it one of the most recognizable passenger jets on the runway. They're being flown by almost every major airline. The DC-10 was a very popular airplane. It was one of the first jumbo jets, so the airlines were able to put uh, twice as many people on board the airplane and only feed three engines instead of four, so it was much more economical for them because they could eliminate a lot of flights and still carry the same number of passengers. American 191, good afternoon. Taxiing into position on runway 32, right and hold. American 191, thank you. Taxi and hold, runway 32, right. Flaps and slats to 10. Takeoff and landing are the most crucial and most difficult and busiest times in the cockpit. It's the Friday before Memorial Day. There are 258 passengers on board for the flight to Los Angeles. On this flight, a live feed from a video camera mounted in the cockpit allows passengers to watch the takeoff from the cabin. It's a new feature for American Airlines. It was simply showing the runway and what the pilots were seeing as you took off or as you came in for a landing. So it was just like a movie for the passengers. American 191, you are clear for takeoff. American 191, underway. You have control. I have control. Runway clear. Clear. OK, setting takeoff thrust. Here we go. Apply takeoff power. You've got three engines pushing you down the runway. Sharing the pilot's view from the cockpit is a thrill for many on board. At 3.04 p.m., the plane is seconds away from lifting off. V1, you accelerate to V1, which is the the speed beyond which you can no longer abort the takeoff. So you have to keep going. You have to take off no matter what happens. Rotate. A few seconds later, you reach rotation speed. This is when you the pilot would lift the nose. The, uh, the front wheel would come off the runway. There's the turbulence. 
Not too rough. Did you see that? I've lost power to my side. The captain's instruments suddenly go dead. Looks like we've lost number one. And he's lost power from the left engine. But the plane is already airborne. You have to keep going. You have to climb out. And if there's something wrong with the airplane, even if the problems are critical, your best hope is to keep going, to climb, contact ATC, and come around and land somehow, somewhere. Look at this. Look at this. Equipment. I need equipment. You blew an engine. The DC-10 should be able to climb with only two engines. These multi-engine planes are specifically designed to take off with one engine out. They are designed to climb out at a brisk rate of speed and, and to climb to a safe altitude with one of the engines missing. Pilots are trained to cope with this kind of emergency. First, they need to get as far from the ground as they can. Altitude is critical. There's a saying that pilots have, the three things you need are altitude, airspeed, and an idea. They put their plane into a steeper climb. Forward speed drops. If you have room to play with, if you have the altitude, now you can look around and try to figure out what went wrong and try to institute some corrective measures. American 191 Heavy, you want to come back? And to what runway? We're back. Go right, go right. The plane is banking sharply to the left. It's only 325 feet from the ground. They were applying full right aileron because the left wing was going down. And by applying full right aileron, what you're doing is trying to lift that wing back up that has gone down. You might try to turn the ailerons the other way harder. And if that still doesn't work, something's clearly wrong. I can't hold it. American 191 Heavy, do you copy? He's not talking to me. Losing power from one engine should not be causing the plane to bank. Passengers have a frightening view of the ground below. What's going on? The pilots can't get the altitude they need, and they're banking further and further to the left. Go right, go right, come on, come on! 300 feet, we're losing altitude. The cockpit camera gives passengers a glimpse of their fate. But they are not the only ones whose lives are in danger. A trailer park just north of the airport is home to thousands of people. Oh, God. And the plane is heading straight for it. Witnesses on the ground can clearly see Flight 191 flying on its side. We're still turning. Level, baby, level. Well, certainly it would be a very, very scary thing. I mean, you would certainly know that you were about to die. Uh, we're losing it. Go right, go right, go right. There he goes. The DC-10 crashes into an airport hangar at the edge of the airport. The full load of fuel instantly ignites. DC-10 with 271 souls on board has gone down. Northwest of runway 32 right. It only got about 300 feet above the ground and it traveled maybe 4,600 feet or so beyond the end of the runway before it crashed into a field. As soon as we pulled out of the station, we could see the column of smoke. And as, of course, as we got closer and closer, it was heavier, and, and uh, uh, you could see how big the site was. Less than a minute after takeoff, there is almost nothing left of Flight 191. Everything was, was smoldering, and I remember seeing pieces of the aircraft that were very recognizable, such as the landing gear, and I remember seeing one of the engines also. Rescuers find a horrifying scene. You saw what, what was recognizable as torsos, body parts. 
it just brought back the human element and you realized and thought about the people who were on board. As they begin assessing the full scope of the disaster, they have very little hope that anyone has survived. American Airlines Flight 191 has crashed, just short of the trailer park beside Chicago's O'Hare Airport. The DC-10 has also obliterated a hangar beyond the runway. There were some distinct odors. Jet fuel, certainly that was, that was the overpowering odor. And then uh, the, the eerie quiet, I remember. Once the fire is under control, the search for survivors can begin. But as you walk the scene, it was, it was pretty obvious pretty quickly that uh, there were no survivors. It was very, very frustrating to realize that no matter what your training was, there was nobody there that you could help. All 271 people on board are dead. Two workers inside the hangar have also been killed. It's the worst aviation disaster in US history. A lot of people saw this happen. Let's see what they can tell us. The National Transportation Safety Board must now figure out what went wrong on Flight 191. This is a breaking news special report. Good evening. An American Airlines DC-10 crashed just after takeoff this afternoon from Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. This is the kind of accident which unfortunately really grabs the imagination of the public and can do so much to cast a stain on the reputation of an airline, of an aircraft, on air travel in general. Thousands of people fly aboard DC-10s every day. If there's a flaw in the plane, investigators need to find it before more people are killed. The stakes were very high for the NTSB to get this investigation right. The airlines wanted the public to understand that this was fundamentally a safe aircraft. They are eager to hear from the many people who saw the crash, especially those with the best view, controllers in the tower. Look at this. Look, look at this. The controllers reveal that Flight 191's left engine didn't simply fail. The engine fell off the plane just after they lifted off. It's not a fall. If you were sitting on the left-hand side of the airplane, what you would have seen was the number one engine on the left side rotated up and flipped back and disappeared behind you. Did you see that? That's the last thing an airline passenger wants to see. These engines are actually designed to go back up over the wing in case of failure so that they will miss the tail as they go by and not cause damage to the tail section. They will go over the tail. The engine has landed 760 meters from the end of runway 32 right. The team scours the tarmac for any pieces that came from the plane. How's the DC-10 lose an engine? The smallest piece of evidence could be of vital importance. I've never seen anything like this. That is not supposed to happen. The engineering is supposed to be so robust that that will not occur. So when that happens, you'll have the undivided attention of everybody involved in the investigation, because that's a big deal. In the entire history of commercial aviation, there have only been a handful of similar incidents. But concerns over the safety of the DC-10 are not new. This is the third major accident for the plane in the last five years. There was a series of fatal accidents that were very high profile in the news and the name DC-10 kept appearing time and again in headlines, led the public to wonder what was going on with this airplane. In 1972, American Airlines Flight 96 lost its rear cargo door shortly after takeoff from Detroit. The DC-10 was at almost 12,000 feet when the door blew out, causing an explosive decompression that severed essential control cables. The pilots were able to make a successful emergency landing, saving all on board.
Two years later, the 346 people aboard Turkish Airlines Flight 981 were not so lucky. They all died when their DC-10 crashed into a forest in France after suffering a similar cargo door failure. Public confidence in the airplane was uh, fairly low at this point, and a lot of people would not fly on that airplane. They would book another trip or book another airline to stay away from the airplane. They say if it's a DC-10, uh, put me on another flight. I don't particularly like flying DC-10s, but you know, it's the only flight we can take, so we take it. Investigators desperately need to know how an engine fell off a plane carrying 271 people. They search the charred debris for the plane's flight recorders. When you've got a plane that's as destroyed on impact as this plane was, the data from the, uh, from the recorders can be essential because that really is your only source of information. The team is able to recover both black boxes, but the recorders are heavily damaged. It will take time to analyze the data. What you got? The investigative team soon makes another discovery. It's one of the bushing bolts split right in two. It could prove to be crucial. They found a bolt that had broken. And the question that was raised was, did this bolt break before the accident and cause it, or did it break as a result of the accident? The left and right engines of the DC-10 are mounted to the wings through a rigging system known as the pylon. The bolt found on the runway is one of the few holding it in place. The badly damaged bolt was found closer to the start of the runway, suggesting that it may have been the first thing to come off the plane. So what do you think? the investigative team believe they have found the culprit. This would explain it. The NTSB is under enormous pressure to explain how an engine could simply fall off a widely used passenger jet. Two days after the crash, they hold a news conference to announce that they found the cause, a broken bolt. There's the bolt. There's a nut still attached to part of the bolt. This is a fracture point. Well, I arrived at the scene of the investigation, and it was a press conference going on at that time, in which the vice chairman of the safety board was speaking, and he had just concluded. Michael Marks is a metallurgist with the NTSB. What did you guys say about the bolt? We said, this is it. This is why the engine came off. He's an expert in fractures and failures of airplane parts. It was related to me that he had indicated that a bolt that was found on the runway was involved in the engine separation. Tell me you have more evidence than that. When I visually looked at it, I could see nothing on the bolt that would indicate anything out of the ordinary. So all I could do is say this bolt didn't have any pre-existing cracking on it or have anything that, that would indicate that it had a weakness in the structure. This thing broke when it hit the runway, not before. So not exactly our smoking gun. We need more information. And to announce that you basically have some kind of cause for that engine separation without really looking at it, it was not a good idea to come out with this at that particular time. And so more caution was needed. OK, look, we've got to forget about the media and focus on the evidence. It turned out that it didn't cause the accident. But going in, you don't know what is going to turn out to be important and what's just a red herring. The confusion at the press conference only increases the pressure. There's no room for any more mistakes. For now, the team can only study the wreckage for clues. They hope there is enough of the plane left to help them make sense of what happened. Hold on, let me see that. OK. Good. Anything from the main crash site goes over here. Anything from the runway, any engine or wing parts, goes to that side. Well, my first priorities would be to look at the actual parts, the actual separation. Where is it that this thing broke? This is definitely part of the pylon. I've never seen one break like that. 
The pylons are mounted under the wings. Each one is strong enough to suspend a 5,300 kilogram engine. The pylon is designed very well. I mean, it's, it's strength-wise. So it basically could take a lot of load, much more load than you would normally see in the course of the uh, airplane life. The pylon gets its strength from two internal bulkheads, one forward and one aft. These bulkheads also provide secure points of attachment, ensuring that the engines are firmly fixed to the wings. It's also designed to have multiple load paths so that it's what they call fail-safe design. It seems incredible that a pylon, one of the strongest parts of the plane, could have broken. Perhaps the fail-safe design is flawed. If so, it could be just a matter of time before another pylon breaks in mid-air. Any idea what happened to that? I need to see the rest of the pylon. As some investigators search the wreckage near the airport for the rest of the broken pylon, others are finally able to listen to the cockpit voice recorder. It should reveal if the pilots had any indications of a problem as they were taking off. Okay, go ahead. American 191, thank you. Taxi and hold, runway 32 right. Flaps and slats to tap. The taxi and takeoff roll are perfectly routine. American 191, underway. There is no indication the pilots were having any problems. Okay, setting takeoff thrust. Here we go. Sounds pretty routine so far. The one, rotate. Damn. Is that it? One of the tricky things about this accident for investigators was that the nature of the damage was such that the cockpit voice recorder itself was rendered inoperable. So that was a big loss of, of, of clues. The voice recorder was powered by the left engine. Damn. Once it fell off, the recording stopped. Thanks. About the last thing they heard on there was just damn. And that was the end of the recording and that told them absolutely nothing. They may never know what happened in the cockpit after the engine fell off. The flight data recorder is also nearly useless. Because of the extreme way the plane was flying, a lot of the data makes no sense. This isn't gonna help us. But at the hangar, there's been some progress. Investigators have recovered all the pieces of the pylon. Michael Marks may now be a step closer to figuring out why it broke apart. Now I had an indication that maybe that this is, this is the, the area that we really should be looking at. So in doing that, you needed to get more detailed inspections of it. You needed to get it to the laboratory back in Washington, D.C. Investigators also examined the plane's history for anything that might relate to this catastrophic failure. John Golia spent nine years as a senior maintenance expert for the NTSB. Instantly, if we know we had an engine falling off, you're going to go right for the maintenance records. You're going to go right to the history of the airplane. They had the engine out at the end of March. Eight weeks before the accident, the left engine was removed for servicing. Any time that you have an airplane that's been into maintenance uh, just before a crash, that also raises all sorts of warning flags, all sorts. Uh, go down to Tulsa. Let's see what they did. If you have an investigation that involves maintenance, you don't go inside the hangar, you don't follow that trail, you're going to miss some issues. Why the pylon broke is not the only question that needs to be answered. Damn. I've lost power to my side. Looks like we've lost number one. Two of the DC-10's three engines kept working. The plane had the power it needed to keep climbing and then get back to the airport. In fact, uh, you could lose a second engine shortly after left off and you would still be able to power the aircraft around. But somehow, experienced pilots weren't able to fly this plane after losing just one engine. With 273 people dead after an engine fell off a plane, the FAA makes a drastic decision. 
On June the 6th, 1979, the agency grounds every DC-10 in the United States. 138 planes in total. Well, you can imagine if one of your real workhorse airplanes is grounded, disrupting flights, inconveniencing passengers, generating headlines, it's a terrible situation. You spend $100 million for an airplane, you can't leave it sitting around uh, very long. It's costing you a lot of money every day to have that airplane on the ground. All foreign-based DC-10s are banned from entering U.S. airspace. The pressure on investigators mounts as the effects of America's worst air disaster spread across the globe. Investigator Michael Marks believes the shattered pieces from the engine pylon may explain why Flight 191 fell from the sky. Hey, look for yourself. See, that had to happen before the crash. I just don't know why. When looking at the aft uh, bulkhead uh, in detail, uh, there was a one very puzzling thing. A close examination reveals a crack in the metal that clearly developed slowly over time. It's a telltale sign that the pylon bulkhead was already damaged before the crash. You can see where it spread, all along there. The crack that Michael Marks finds runs along the top edge of the aft bulkhead. The cracks were consistent with a fatigue phenomenon or a cyclic behavior, a crack extending from repeated loads. Each time the load occurs, you then have an extension of the crack. The microscopic examination gives Marks another clue, a dent on the pylon bulkhead at exactly the point where the crack began. There was also a deformation that was on one of the fractures at that time, was not absolutely sure what it all meant because it just showed a deformation. Looks like something hit the pylon. I'm just not sure what or when. Okay, I'll see what I can find. <sighs> Take notes on everything. Got it. The information is available. It's on the hangar floor. It's in the minds of those people. We just have to ferret it out. Investigators arrange to watch as another DC-10 undergoes the same maintenance that was performed on Flight 191 just weeks before the crash. Can you take me up and show me how the engine's mounted? We're going to talk to the, to the people involved. Most likely it's going to be the maintenance personnel. And we're going to ask them pointed questions. You know, on what have you done? Have you done this job before? What kind of problems did you encounter? Did you follow the paperwork to the letter religiously? Step one, step two, step three. They found procedures that were not in the manual. They found procedures that the manufacturer didn't recommend be performed. To save time, the airline has modified a key maintenance procedure. A wing-mounted engine on a DC-10 is a 24-hour adventure, which is extremely long. So there's a lot of pressure on it getting whatever is broken repaired and getting the airplane back in the sky. The normal procedure for servicing an engine involves removing it from the pylon and leaving the pylon attached to the wing. There are hundreds of connections to be undone procedures from the manufacturer were deemed to be too time-consuming and they could do it faster, better, cheaper. So they were deviating from the procedures. The quicker way involves taking out just three bolts. The engine is removed from the wing while still attached to the pylon. It saves about 200 man-hours of labor. It was easier. The attach points from the pylon to the wing were accessible the attach points from the engine to the pylon were much more difficult to take apart and put back together. Removing's not the issue, it's the attempt to reinstall. Whoa, stop! Is where the problem comes from. Left a bit. Now up. Maneuvering the pylon into position with an engine attached to it is a tricky procedure. Trying to put the engine and the pylon back together, some 13,000 pounds for the engine and 2,000 pounds for the pylon, was not easy. They were using the forklift and this forklift is not very manageable. It, it cannot be finely controlled as far as the altitude is concerned. The minimum movement on the forklift was like a, something on the order of a quarter of an inch. 
and we're talking about trying to fit something together that might be in the order of thousandths of an inch. Whoa, stop, stop. So you get just slightly the wrong angle and you get too much pressure on it and you're gonna crack those fittings. I'm sure they didn't realize that, uh, how quickly they could get in trouble doing it the way they were doing it. I think I know what happened. A possible explanation surfaces. Take her down. For the mysterious dent found on the pylon from Flight 191. The team in Tulsa calls Marx. What do you got? They describe how the maintenance crew struggled to fit the pylon attachment into the mounting bracket, or clevis. And, and then it all came together, just like a, a bolt of lightning. The clevis itself had produced this deformation that was on the fracture. Marx concludes that on the accident plane, the clevis must have slammed into the top of the pylon bulkhead as the engine was being reattached. The impact could have started the crack that led to the pylon's failure and to the crash itself. The maintenance people that did this operation, which cracked the pylon, probably didn't hear anything and bang or crack or anything like that. OK, bring her up. We call it work around. So they work around the manual to get the job done quicker. But in the, the process never gets the proper vetting, if you will, review from engineering and from the manufacturer. And uh, sometimes those alternate methods have unintended consequences. Over the next eight weeks, each time the plane took off, the stress that the massive engine put on the pylon made the crack grow larger. The engine is not only imparting a thrust load, but it's also imparting a sideways load. So each time you have this load, it breaks a little bit more and more and more. It was only a matter of time before the pylon snapped and the engine fell off. So the process was flawed and the people made adjustments to a flawed process to try to make it work. And collectively, that is a recipe for disaster. How long have you been putting the engines on this way? Not sure, but every airline does it. Even more worrying, the mechanics at American Airlines are not the only ones cutting corners. The airline shared processes. And since this engine change was so time consuming and costly, they were all looking for a, a better way of doing it, a faster, better, cheaper way to do it. And so when one would discover it, uh, a process to use that maybe made the engine change go quicker, uh, the others were very quick to adopt it, and that's exactly what we see here. We need to get the entire fleet inspected for this. It is now clear why the engine fell from the plane, but what happened after that is still a mystery. Flight 191 could have landed safely with one missing engine. Instead, 273 people died in a horrific crash. The plane was completely flyable. It was in bad shape, it had lost an engine, it had lost several critical systems, but it was still airworthy and was still able to fly. What happened in that cockpit? The crash of Flight 191 has a devastating effect on the entire airline industry. It was a huge economic problem for the airlines because their major airplane was now on the ground and they couldn't fly it. And of course, I think it had a big impact on the public as well. Have you seen this? So why weren't the pilots able to save their plane after losing one engine? A chance photograph taken just before the crash may provide some answers. There was certainly one very famous photograph that was published in many newspapers of the aircraft in a semi-inverted position, almost ready to strike the ground. Everyone saw this picture. I want you to track down all the pictures you can and get them blown up. I want to see those wings. You got it. These photographs that can do so much to horrify the public can have a real use for the accident investigators. By examining photographs taken just prior to the crash, they might be able to tell whether the pilots made some mistake when they configured their plane for takeoff. Flaps and ailerons look fine. 
by blowing up and zooming in on the leading edge of the wing, the aircraft investigators were able to determine what was going on. Is that hydraulic fluid? If the fluid leaked from the plane's hydraulic system, it might explain why the plane was so hard to control. Sometimes the, the crucial element in air crash investigation can be some very small, subtle detail from which everything else can devolve. Several of the DC-10's hydraulic lines run along the leading edge of the wing. Take a look at this. It's the area that was damaged the most when the engine broke free. We need to see those slats. American 191, thank you. Taxi and hold, runway 32 right. Flaps and slats to 10. The plane's slats are extended before takeoff. They're essential for providing the lift needed to get the plane airborne. The slats are on the leading edge of the wing, and uh, when you deploy the slats, they move out forward. So the air has a longer distance to go, and therefore is moving faster, and it creates more of a lift, a vacuum above the wing. If the hydraulic system controlling the slats failed, it could explain the plane's loss of control. Investigators discover that while all the slats on the right wing were extended for takeoff, some on the left wing were not. It's a configuration that's normally impossible. You have one wing that is flying and the other wing that isn't. And when you have a wing that's flying and one that isn't, uh, the one that isn't flying dips and the one that is flying continues to fly, which means the airplane goes into a roll. They conclude that the engine hit the wing with enough force to rupture the hydraulic lines. The fluid keeping the slats extended on the left wing would have drained quickly. I can't hold it! Without fluid, some slats on the left wing retracted, causing that wing to lose lift. The plane began to roll. The actual stalling speed was 124 knots for the airplane in this, at this weight and configuration. I'm losing it! The fact that the slat had retracted raised the stalling speed to 159 knots from 124 knots, so it was a huge difference. Without the slats, they needed to be flying much faster than normal to avoid stalling. One final question remains. Why couldn't the pilots recover from the stalled wing? Investigators recreate the takeoff in a flight simulator to find out. OK, you all set? We're ready, let's try one. B1. This crew had almost 5,000 hours in this aircraft. You couldn't ask for a more experienced crew in this airplane, and if anybody was going to be able to fly that airplane in that condition, it would have been this crew. Immediately after the slats retract, there are dramatic warnings in the cockpit. There is a stall warning system that will advise the pilots when the airplane is about to stall. It's called a stick shaker, and when you're nearing the stall speed, your stick will actually start to shake to warn you of this. The stick shaker does exactly as the name suggests. It vibrates the control column to get the pilot's attention. If you get a stall warning, you obviously lower the nose and you apply full power and you fly it out of the stall. If they had lowered the nose, let the airspeed increase, they actually would have been fine. The plane was recoverable, it was landable. The simulator tests show that once the pilots are alerted to the problem, it is possible to recover. Why didn't they do that? If the pilots on Flight 191 had known they were stalling, they could have been able to save their plane. It seems possible that somehow they didn't know. Investigators study the cockpit warning system on the DC-10 and make a crucial discovery. All the alarms are powered by the left engine. When the engine fell off, it severed hydraulic systems, it severed electrical systems. I've lost power to my side. Looks like we've lost number one. It resulted in a loss of instrumentation and of warning uh, devices. As soon as the left engine came off, 
the warnings that could have saved the plane were disabled. They bring in a new test pilot to fly the simulation. Okay, you all set? What they don't tell him... We're ready, let's try one. ...is that all the warnings have been disconnected. V1. From that position in the cockpit, you can't see that left wing, and you, it, they didn't even know the engine was actually gone. They thought it had just stopped. Looks like we've lost number one. When um, pilots say lose an engine, we mean lose engine power. This plane actually lost an engine. Without warnings, the test pilot is in the same plight as the American Airlines crew. He has no idea his plane has stalled. The stick shaker stall warning device had been functioning. It's very easy to imagine that the pilot flying the airplane would have put the nose down and would have avoided the stall. We're banking. Go right, go right. Since they don't know about the stall, they follow the procedure for an engine failure on takeoff. It sealed their fate. Pilots were taught at that point in time that if you lost an engine, the whole idea was to get more altitude faster and get away from the ground. So if you lost a second engine, you would have that much more altitude to play with. And so you were taught to pull back on the wheel and go back to the minimum safe flying speed to get away from the ground. Reduce speed to 153 knots. Reducing speed to 153 knots. Reducing speed by lifting the nose is the exact opposite of what pilots need to do when a plane is about to stall. It makes the stall worse and the roll more severe. Following the checklist for a single engine failure made what happened next inevitable and doomed everyone on board. If they didn't know they were stalling, they didn't stand a chance. The pilots flew the plane exactly as they'd been trained to do, exactly as procedure demanded that they fly it. The pilots were doing absolutely the right thing. There was absolutely nothing that he could have done. He was powerless. He was along for the ride. The NTSB concludes the pilots were not at fault. They do, however, fault American Airlines maintenance practices and the FAA for not enforcing proper procedures. The FAA mandates that stick shakers be installed on both pilots' control columns and that the warning system be powered by more than one engine. The plane's hydraulics are also redesigned with special plugs to prevent slats and other control surfaces from retracting if the lines are cut. When the airplane was grounded as a result of this accident, we found a number of other airplanes with cracks in the fleet. Inspectors find eight more DC-10s with damaged pylons. It was very scary when, it, when the inspections uncovered so many other airplanes with problems. That was very, very scary, because every one of those had the potential of being another accident. And had we not done the grounding, and we may have had to have yet another accident before we realized the, the width and breadth of the problem. This kind of accident never happened again. This engine never fell off this kind of airplane again. Um, in, the, in the general sense, though, it teaches us how to look at safety. It teaches us how to look at the culture of training and procedures in the air and procedures on the ground. Whoa, stop, stop. One final outcome of the Flight 191 disaster Airlines reconsidered the idea of sending live video to passengers in the cabin. The passengers were able to see the airplane going into this dive and were able to see their own demise in effect. The cockpit camera was abandoned. But the shocking photo of Flight 191's last moments remains. An image that both the airlines and the FAA likely wish could be erased. They would much rather have people think of air travel as cramped seats, bad food, luggage being lost, than with dying. Luggage being lost will make people grumble, but people dying will make people not fly.
At the time, it was the worst crash in aviation history. It was just a scene of absolute, utter devastation. In 1974, more than 300 people died when their plane fell from the sky. There's barely anything left here that's recognizable as being a part of an aircraft. You couldn't walk anywhere without the danger you were going to stand on a part of a human being. The key to understanding the disaster is found thousands of kilometers away. An unusual piece of evidence that tells the troubling story of a crash that could have been prevented. June the 12th, 1972. One of the newest members of American Airlines fleet is in Detroit, Michigan. John, Paige. Flight 96, a brand new DC-10, is getting ready for takeoff. Captain Bryce McCormick and co-pilot Paige Whitney have been in the plane for hours. Back there, so when we're in flight, if you can get a chance just to look at that. Detroit is just a stopover on a flight from L.A. to Buffalo and then to New York. You, got there. you ready to try one, Page? All right, sir. McCormick has flown the plane out from California, but Whitney is going to fly the next leg. Both men want as much time at the controls as possible. Neither one of them has more than 75 hours flying the DC-10. Few pilots have more. There simply aren't enough of the planes in the air. In 1972, the DC-10 had just been introduced. The plane is the latest advance to passenger jets. Its style and its size set it apart from other airliners. The McDonnell Douglas Corporation has spent more than a billion dollars developing it. In the late 60s, there was a race going among the three major manufacturers of jetliners, uh, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, and Lockheed, to see who could get the, the first jumbo out. So they got really busy on getting this DC-10 in to production as fast as they could. And one of the things that they could not suffer were many delays based on some problem with the design. American Airlines is one of the first companies to buy the plane. Flight 96 is one of those planes. Just the fifth DC-10 ever built. Cydia Smith has just been trained to be the chief flight attendant on the DC-10. I was excited because it was the, one of the first jumbos that we had. And I was going to have the opportunity to fly number one, which is what I always wanted to do on a big jet. OK, you got it? And on the wheel. I got you. One, rotate. Just after seven in the evening, Flight 96 lifts off from Detroit Airport. Just minutes after takeoff, the plane is rising easily through 3,500 meters over Windsor, Ontario, Canada. I was sitting in my seat, and the captain had turned off the fasten seatbelt sign, and I was making my way to the galley, and I had to go sort of downhill because we were climbing to go to the galley to turn on the coffee.
when I, when I punched the coffee and I moved over to one side, that's when it happened. I remember falling over because the plane was going, was like this, but all of a sudden it just went like this. I saw ceiling compartments fall, and I saw things coming out of pockets and everything, and I thought to myself, oh, boy. It, it felt like the last day of my life. We hit something. We lost an engine here. In the cockpit, the crew is fighting for control of their jet. The throttles which control the three engines have snapped to idle. The plane loses almost all its thrust. The huge jet begins slowing down. The plane immediately took a huge drop. And the next thing that happened was I was hit in the face with, with a piece of the plane. My husband was frantically trying to find a stewardess to give me something to pr put a pressure on my face to stop the bleeding. Let me have it! McCormick takes over control of the plane. He and Whitney wrestle the jet level. But Flight 96 has been badly damaged. Have we got hydraulics? No, I've got full rudder here. The rudder on the tail, which controls the direction of the jet, is jammed to the right. That's forcing the plane to swing dramatically in that direction. While McCormick fights to turn his damaged plane back to Detroit, Sidia Smith is shocked to see a gaping hole in the floor of the main passenger cabin. People were asking me, you know, what to do, and I knew that I didn't know what to tell them. Smith has been able to account for all of her passengers, but flight attendant Sandra McConnell is missing. Sandra! Can you hear me? Sandra, where are you? And finally, I saw her come out of one of the bathrooms. McConnell has to cross the hole in the floor to move to safety. Almost every step she took, the floor kept collapsing. The crew brings up power to the engines on the wings. But the third engine on the tail stubbornly refuses to respond. Center, this is American Airlines Flight 96. We got an emergency. American 96, roger. Type of emergency? We've got a jammed rudder. We need to get down and make an approach. Along with his engine and his rudder, McCormick is also having trouble controlling the elevators on the tail of the plane. They help him move the massive plane up and down. They're slow to respond, but he can move them. The situation isn't completely hopeless. I think it's going to fly! American 96, turn for the right, heading to zero, zero. Without complete control of the elevators, and with a rudder that's frozen to the right, McCormick has to use his engines to turn the plane. By increasing the thrust on one side of the plane, he can change direction. But it won't be fast. I have no rudder control whatsoever. So our turns are gonna have to be very slow and cautious. All of the passengers move as far away from the hole in the back as possible. But apart from the cut to Loretta Kaminsky, so far there are no other serious injuries. Everyone ready 
for an emergency landing. Bryce McCormick's DC-10 is badly damaged. The lives of everyone on board now depend entirely on his ability to land a plane that can barely fly. With explosive suddenness, a short flight from Detroit to Buffalo has become the most challenging flight of Captain Bryce McCormick's career. He's down an engine, and he can't move his rudder. As he heads back to Detroit, McCormick begins to slow his plane down so it can land safely. But when he does, his plane begins falling dangerously fast. Ideally, McCormick should be descending at 700 feet a minute. But now he's falling more than twice that fast. 1,600 feet per minute. What's the sink rate? Sink rate. 1,600! At this rate, McCormick will crash well short of the runway. He increases power to his engines to slow his fall. Sink rate, 700. McCormick has slowed the plane's descent to 700 feet per minute. But to do that, he's had to increase his forward airspeed, which means he'll be landing far faster than usual. For the first time since the beginning of the crisis, McCormick talks to the passengers. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We've had a small problem, but the plane is under control now, and we're heading back to Detroit for an emergency landing. Bryce McCormick was as calm as if he were welcoming you on the plane. As the plane nears the airport, flight attendants ask passengers to remove their shoes and any sharp pieces of jewelry. They had to take off their shoes and glasses. We collected everything in a, in a blanket. Less than half an hour after leaving, the badly damaged DC-10 struggles back to the Detroit airport. The few minutes that it took to get back to Detroit were the longest minutes that I will ever remember spending on an airplane because we were sure that we were not going to survive. Captain Bryce McCormick now needs to give the jet even more power to push the nose up for landing. His plane is still drifting to the right and traveling fast. I have no rudder to straighten it out when it hits. The DC-10 with 67 people aboard roars toward the runway at almost 300 kilometers an hour. The landing was the most frightening part of the entire flight. When the plane hits the ground, it begins veering hard to the right. Once the plane landed, it seemed like we just went on forever. I mean, it was just forever. One set of landing gear wheels runs off the runway and through the grass. After a harrowing touchdown, the plane eventually comes to a stop just 300 meters from the end of the runway. Okay. Engines off at your discretion. Shut him down. Every woman wanted to hug him, and um, he was just amazing because we. Th it was just at that moment that we all realized that we were alive because of him, that he literally had saved our lives. Oh. <laughs> 
If you take a look at something like this and you say, well, there's good flying and there's bad flying, this is beyond good. This is superlative. This is using every instinct you have as an airman and all the, all the capabilities you have to stay calm enough to get the situation assessed. With the plane on the ground, the crew has its first opportunity to inspect the damage. The captain and I walked back when everybody was off. We walked back to the um, back and we just looked up and saw this hole. And it was just so weird. There's no indication that the jet hit something as the pilots first thought. What has caused such damage to the airliner? The hole was so enormous that if anyone had been sitting in the seats that were there, they would have been sucked out immediately. At that point, they still felt it might have been a bomb. But while the incident had happened with explosive suddenness, no indication of a bomb is found. As investigators begin their work, they discover that not all of the DC-10 is at the Detroit airport. A coffin that the plane was carrying in its cargo hold is discovered 30 kilometers away from the Detroit airport, near Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Investigators also find the plane's rear cargo door. Doors are not supposed to fall off airplanes, especially since it was a rather new airplane. You would not expect some, something like that to happen. When they examine the cargo area of the plane, they discover that the very design of the door makes it a potential weak spot. These don't look like most doors on a jet open inward. In fact, the door is slightly larger than the frame it fits into. As the pressure builds inside a jet, this type of plug door is actually forced into the frame of the aircraft. The design makes the door extremely safe. But McDonnell Douglas designed the cargo door on the DC-10 to open outward. That decision was made to increase the amount of storage space on the plane. When it's closed, hooks on the DC-10's door grab hold of a bar on the plane's door frame. To make sure it's closed, baggage handlers push down on a lever, which drives locking pins through the hooks, which hold them in place. When investigators examined the cargo area of the plane, they don't find any structural damage around the door. When they study the locks on the cargo door itself, they find that the latches are not completely closed. And the pins that are supposed to make sure the door is locked are not in their locked position. When we interrogated the uh, cargo handler that closed the door, uh, it became immediately apparent that he used excessive force to close the door. And in fact, he said he had to use his knee to get the, the door handle to go flush. Investigators make a frightening discovery. It's possible to close the lever on the outside of the door, even if the hooks and locking pins are not in the closed position. Paul Eddy is a journalist who investigated the history of the DC-10. What Windsor showed is that you could actually pull the handle in order to buckle the top fixture so that the handle went home properly, but the locking pins had not gone through the spools. Engage the lever. This means that baggage handlers can believe the door is closed when it's not. Not only can the outside lever be closed without the locks being fully engaged, there's no way for the crew of the plane to know. The faulty locking pins will still turn off the warning light, even though they aren't in their proper position. The door was a ticking time bomb. 
As passenger jets climb, the difference between the pressure inside the plane and the pressure outside the plane grows. If a door isn't properly shut, it will blow out with explosive force. The problem on the American Airlines flight began as the plane passed through 3,500 meters. When the door blew, the coffin in the cargo hold was sucked out. When the air pressure inside the plane was released, anything that wasn't firmly attached was pulled out of the airliner. It's a really startling thing if you're not expecting it. What you've got is a lot of air stuffed inside this pressure vessel that now wants to get out. And the bigger the airplane is, the more powerful the hurricane of air leaving the airplane is during that period of time. By itself, explosive decompression does not make a plane unflyable. So why had Captain McCormick experienced such difficulties controlling his jet? Investigators take a closer look at the back of the plane's cabin and learn that the very design of the DC-10 makes it vulnerable. When the cargo door blew off, there was so much pressure on the floor of the cabin that it collapsed into the cargo compartment below. When it did, the floor ripped into some of the plane's critical control systems. When it collapsed the floor, it took the cables that controlled number two engine, and it took most of the cables, or impeded most of the cables that had to do with the flight controls in the back. I think it's going to fly! It left McCormick just enough control to keep his plane level. The remarkable flying of Bryce McCormick had saved the lives of everyone on board Flight 96. But there was a problem with one of the newest and most expensive planes flying over North America. In the Windsor incident, there was an obvious flaw. And that's where the NTSB said, look, here is really the smoking gun, the ability to close that thing without having all those locks engaged. Let's make sure we change this system right now. Every DC-10 operator needs to know this. Right. I want everything checked. I want all the bolts checked first. Chuck Miller is the head of the NTSB's Aviation Safety Bureau. We have to check all the latches, OK? Every single latch. It's his responsibility to point out problems with the new DC-10 and propose solutions. He helps write the fixes he thinks McDonnell Douglas needs to make to keep the plane safe. He was a very, very professional man, and he had his, his investigators had enormous respect for him. Chuck didn't sit back at, in the office. Chuck was always on the scene. For Chuck Miller, fixing the DC-10 is a matter of professional pride. For McDonnell Douglas, the near accident over Windsor has enormous implications. Their billion dollar gamble came close to tumbling from the sky. If anything else goes wrong, the company itself could be at stake. March the 3rd, 1974 a perfect spring-like day in Paris. It's been almost two years since a DC-10 came close to crashing near Windsor, Ontario. Now more than 50 of the new planes are flying around the world. One of them, Plane 29, is owned by Turkish Airlines. Normally, the last leg of this trip from Turkey to England wouldn't be very crowded. But today, the DC-10 is filling up fast. People are squeezing into seats throughout the plane. A strike at a British airline has passengers scrambling for any flight back to London. Wendy Wheel is one of many last-minute additions to the flight. A model, she's returning home after a shoot in Spain. We'd been married for 18 months, and uh, we were about to start a family. I believe the secret of her success for, for modelling was 
not just that she was a very attractive girl um, and good model material, but she was generally liked by all the photographers because she had such a pleasing, lovely, light personality. With all the new passengers boarding, the flight is a little behind schedule. And it's not only the crew who are waiting. At the back of the plane is baggage handler Mohammed Mahmoudi. With all the new passengers, he's not sure if there are any more bags to load. Not expecting any other luggage, Mahmoudi locks the rear cargo door. The DC-10 is set to go. Just after 12.30 in the afternoon, THY Flight 981 lifts off into the skies above Paris. London is less than an hour away. Price Control, this is Tango Hotel Yankee 981. We're at 6-0. Requesting clearance to flight level 230. Tango Hotel Yankee 981, you are cleared to flight level 230. 981, Roger. As it flies away from the airport, the DC 10 continues to gain altitude. 2,700 meters, 3,000 meters, 3,300 meters. The huge jet shudders and banks to the left. Are you sure? Just 16 seconds after the start of the crisis, the crew struggles to save their crippled jet. The nose is pitching down, the plane picking up speed. Bring it up! Oh, no, no. I can't bring it up! She doesn't respond! Passengers at the back of the plane witness a horrifying scene. Two rows of seats have simply disappeared. Through a huge hole in the floor, passengers can see the sky over France. 7,000 feet! Hydraulics! We've lost it! The crew discovers that they have no hydraulic power with which to control the plane. Without it, they can't move their rudder or elevators. Even without its most basic controls, the plane begins to level out. But it's fallen too far. It looks like we're going to hit the ground! Speed! The DC-10 is traveling almost 800 kilometers an hour. The flight from Paris to London never even makes it to the English Channel. Just nine minutes after taking off, Turkish Airways Flight 981 becomes the worst plane crash of all time. In London, the flight is listed as delayed. The news of the crash comes out slowly. I went to the uh, ticket office kiosk, and I s asked what has happened to the flight. And instantly, the look on the gentleman's face behind the counter told me something was wrong, instantly. There's barely anything left here that's recognizable as being a part of an aircraft. I looked on the television and I just thought, well, I just hope she's dead. 
because I just saw the carnage of the forest in Sonlis, and it was like looking at a, a First World War trench movie. Flight 981, carrying 346 passengers, virtually disintegrates on impact. There are no survivors. It was just a scene of absolute, utter devastation. And it, the, the litter of personal possessions, electric wires, bits of metal, bits of bodies, just strewn everywhere. I mean, you couldn't walk. You couldn't walk anywhere without the, the danger you were going to stand on a part of a human being. I still have nightmares about this, even though it's 33 years ago. Investigators for the French Accident Investigation Bureau are quickly on the scene. My first job was to evaluate the scope of the wreckage and to begin the first investigation on the spot. At first, I was unable to know what has happened. I was just seeing that a terrible crash has occurred and that it will be a very hard uh, work for the investigators. Despite the enormous force of the crash, the black boxes, made of three layers of hardened steel and insulation, survive. Their contents could provide valuable clues about the crash. Most of the speculation was that it must have been a bomb because, you know, you've got an almost brand new, very powerful aeroplane flying in clear blue sky and it gets to 12,000 feet and, fall, and falls out of it. Investigators are called to a field 15 kilometers from the crash site. They find a piece of fuselage and two rows of seats from the DC-10. Somehow, they fell free of the airliner before the rest of the plane smashed into the forest. When investigators arrive, the bodies of the passengers who were in the seats have already been removed. When relatives of those who died in the crash arrive in France, they're directed to a small church in the town of Saint-Lys. One of the saddest sights I've ever seen is in this church. They laid out on tables everything they'd found, you know, clothing, um, possessions, teddy bears, rings, watches. Um, and then relatives who wanted to were allowed to come and walk around these trestle tables with all this stuff like that. They produced a little packet with my wife's wedding ring and rings, engagement ring. It was all pretty battered up, so you could imagine the thoughts that went through my mind. Since the accident involves an American plane, the NTSB's Chuck Miller joins the investigation. For the second time in two years, he's dealing with a problem with the DC-10. I don't believe that Miller suspected for one moment that the door hadn't been fixed after Windsor. But it becomes clear that the piece of fuselage found in France is in fact the plane's rear cargo door. It seems like a repeat of the Windsor accident. Miller is left with a haunting question. Why hadn't the problem been fixed? When he saw the door, of course, saw that the, it, had, it hadn't been done, the fix hadn't been made. And that's when uh, I think his anger uh, became very, very strong indeed. Miller takes an unusual step. Although the official investigation is just beginning, he gives journalist Paul Eddy an important tip. I said, have you got any ideas what made the door come off? He said, yeah. Well, if I were you, I'd go and look at a place called Windsor, Ontario. Oh, 
Hello. I'm Chuck Miller. Miller shares his suspicions with the French investigators. Can you please pass these around? These were taken on June 12th, 1972, right after the incident. We have uh, asked for the report on the Windsor accident, and uh, our uh, American colleagues were also uh, volunteers to give us a lot of details. Now, we had an American Airlines flight from Detroit to Buffalo have its cargo door blow off. And he has been very frank and had explained what he was thinking of the Windsor accident. After all the work done during the American Airlines investigation, had something been overlooked? Was there another problem with McDonnell Douglas's enormous plane? With the information from Chuck Miller, French investigators take a closer look at the plane's cargo door. They make a shocking discovery. There is no new problem. It's just like the American Airlines case all over again. The latches that are supposed to hold the cargo door closed aren't locked. And since two rows of seats were sucked out of the DC-10 over Paris, it's clear that the floor on the plane collapsed, just as it had in Windsor. It's not, not, we're going to hit the ground! Ah, we can't see the ground! I'm just bring it up! Stop it, Richard! In fact, when investigators listen to the cockpit voice recorder, the seat. they find that the Turkish flight crew had even less control of their plane than the crew of American Airlines Flight 96. We need to get down and make an approach. I think it's going to fly. Over Windsor, Bryce McCormick was able to recover his plane and land it. But in Paris, all the hydraulic systems were destroyed. The hydraulic fluid helps crews move the rudder and elevators on the tail. Not being able to control them meant the crew couldn't keep their plane in the sky. The basic problem was the Paris flight was much heavier in terms of the number of people on board. The, uh, the floor, when it collapsed, collapsed with such a tremendous amount of pressure that it literally severed all the cables and controlled at the back. They had no hope after that point. You and each of you solemnly swear that the testimony you're Shortly after the crash of Turkish Airlines Flight 981, Chuck Miller is back in the United States. Our first witness this morning is Mr. C.O. Miller, Director of the Bureau of Aviation Safety of the NTSB. This time, he's facing questions from American senators. A potentially catastrophic design defect. A special hearing begins to find out how a problem that was identified in 1972 could bring another plane down two years later. Uh, of course, our understanding up to this time, they all had been. What you've got to now discover is why wasn't that door fixed? Why would a major, venerable, mighty American corporation deliberately do something like this. Less than a month after the near crash over Windsor, the NTSB had made two very specific recommendations. Miller and his investigators recommended that a change be made to the locking mechanism. Engage the lever. They wanted to make sure that it was physically impossible for baggage handlers to close the lever without the locking pins being in place. They also suggested that vents be put into the floors of all DC-10s. This would rapidly allow the pressurized cabin air to equalize without collapsing the floor. But in the two years since the accident, neither one of these recommendations was implemented. There is a fundamental problem at the heart of aviation safety and has been in the United States for a very long time and that is 
that it's the job of the NTSB to discover what's happened uh, and to, to come up with recommendations as to how to prevent it happening again, but it has absolutely no authority to implement them. The NTSB does not have regulatory authority. They have to turn to the FAA, as they did, and say, we want these things done. And that's where the system went wrong. If the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, issues an airworthiness directive, planes are pulled out of service until the proper fix is made. But as serious as the problems on the DC-10 were, no airworthiness directive was ever issued. A so-called gentleman's agreement between the head of the FAA and the head of McDonnell Douglas stopped it from happening. The gentleman's agreement is the root cause of Paris. There is no question that if an airworthiness directive had been issued, as it should have been after Windsor, Paris would not have happened. It was an entirely avoidable accident. McDonnell Douglas assured the FAA that it would fix the problem voluntarily. An airworthiness directive would cast a shadow on the still-fledgling DC-10. The last thing in the world you want is for the public or any of the airlines who are going to be operating these airplanes to think, uh oh, maybe there's some flaws in this bird. And so an airworthiness directive, especially one that requires you to go back and re-engineer something, is a really horrific thought for uh, a manufacturer. McDonnell Douglas did make changes to the way the cargo door was built. A peephole was cut in the bottom of the door so baggage handlers could see if the locking pins had engaged. Several warning signs were also attached to the plane's door. The company also made other changes to the DC-10. These included increasing the length of the locking pins and attaching a plate to the inside of the door. This plate would make it physically impossible to push down the lever if the door wasn't properly locked. But each of the proposed fixes had its own problem. Many baggage handlers didn't know what the small window in the door was for. And the baggage handler in Paris read and spoke three languages, but not English, the only language in which the warning signs were written. The support plate that was supposed to be installed in the door was never attached to the jet that crashed in Paris. Papers confirming the completion of the work are also uncovered. But no matter what the paper trail says, the fix was never made. Again, the problem is you don't have an independent FAA inspector coming along to, set, to look and see it, and then put his stamp on it, because it wasn't an airworthiness directive. In the years following the Turkish Airlines crash, an enormous flurry of lawsuits are filed in California. The tragic story of the DC-10 has one more surprise in store. It's 1974, and an unprecedented series of lawsuits are being filed against McDonnell Douglas. The families of those who died near Paris want someone held responsible. As time went by, I learned more and more about what actually happened and realized that it was not an accident as we would call an accident. It was totally avoidable. My goal was to expose these people. In the weeks leading up to the trial, lawyers who are involved in the case have access to the entire history of the DC-10's development. They're not the only ones who pour through the evidence. So does journalist Paul Eddy. We were determined to get to those documents and that testimony. Somebody gave us a key to the depository where the documents were, and, and so at night we would go in and then had a huge accumulated pile of, of documents to go through in order to find out what they'd been up to. Reading through the immense pile of paper, Eddie makes an incredible discovery. A memo written by Don Applegate, the director of product engineering for Convair, 
the company who'd built the cargo door for McDonnell Douglas. I think the point when we knew we got them was the Applegate memorandum that specifically pre-warned this, this would happen. The memo is a damning indictment of the cargo doors that were being made for the DC-10 and the lack of venting in the cabin floors. It warns that it's only a matter of time before there's a major disaster involving the doors. The airplane demonstrated an inherent susceptibility to catastrophic failure when exposed to explosive decompression of the cargo compartment. The memo, written just weeks after the near disaster in Windsor, recommends that immediate changes be made to the DC-10 cargo door. You know you've got them. You know you've got them, because you know they knew. During the court case, another chilling find is made. Not only did McDonnell Douglas know about the problem after Windsor, they knew during the development of the DC-10. Four years before the Paris crash, two years before Windsor, the cargo door failed during a pressure test. The company knew there was a problem, but the fundamental design of the door stayed the same. I could not believe a large corporation, McDonnell Douglas at the time, could do such a thing, could risk our lives, ordinary people's lives, for the sake of money. Well, in aviation, it's called tombstone technology. In other words, we always have the balance of money. And unfortunately, over the years, it has been true more times than not that we have had to wait until we had enough people die in an accident to say, you know, we really are going to have to spend the money over here. The Applegate memo and other information that comes out during the court case leads to one of the biggest settlements in the history of aviation. McDonnell Douglas paid over $80 million in damages. After the Paris crash, foolproof changes were finally made to the DC-10 cargo door. And this time, nothing was left to chance. The FAA issued an airworthiness directive that ensured the doors would never again open in midair. And it worked. After Paris, there wasn't another serious incident involving the cargo doors on a DC-10. But the plane's history and an intensely competitive industry did have an impact. McDonnell Douglas sold far fewer commercial DC-10s than it had once hoped for. Most of the pilots that I know who have flown the DC-10 over the years really love the old bird. She's probably a little more clunky than the 747 in terms of her heaviness of flight controls, but it's still a lovely bird to fly. That's fine, but you can't disassociate either the, either the airplane or the company from the awful reputation that the crash left. Eventually, McDonnell Douglas itself disappears. The company was bought by Boeing in 1996. In the forest outside Paris, a monument now stands honoring those who were killed on Flight 981. A permanent reminder of one of the most disturbing crashes in the history of aviation. You never forget. And I've gone on to lead uh, my life for 30 odd years, but I've never forgotten. People to this day think it was an accident, and it wasn't.